we wait for Mr. Diaz? I'm yeah, fine with that. We'll be right back. We'll give you a yeah. second. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just went the Not a problem. I know, don't apologize. I'm giving you a hard time. I didn't even realize that Mr. Gonzalez wasn't here, so uh, it's not a problem. He's here now. Yes, sir, good morning. Good morning. I think everyone is here, in, uh, including Mr. Lorenzo. Mr. Lorenzo, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Mr. Gonzalez, good morning. You're standing. So I am, Judge. You, you I have just something. wanted the court for the record to know that this morning I gave Madam Clerk a redacted copy oh, of excellent. the defendant's exhibit number one. Okay. Took the original back and gave it to Mr. Uh, Lorenzo. Excellent. So I want the court to know that that's done and the uh, the exhibit is now in order. I, I, I greatly appreciate that, Mr. Gonzalez. Did the state have an opportunity to review the redacted version? I have. Oh, oh wait. I, I, we, we, we looked at it yesterday. We looked at it before. Okay. All right. So that is now the exhibit that is defense exhibit number one. Um, let me just make sure also, I know we admitted two defense exhibits. Were those, were, was it only two or did I miss any defense exhibits yesterday? Only two, Judge, and, and the other exhibit was entered as as it should have been. Right, as no redactions. Be. Correct. All right. and, and it's not over. Um, Mr. Lorenzo hasn't even gotten to his case in chief, so he certainly will have the opportunity, I think we had discussed, that there were some additional things that he may want to uh, introduce or attempt to introduce. There's that 20 page. So we'll, uh, that that's not, or no, is that one of the exhibits that was admitted? Yeah, yeah. it is, Judge. Oh, okay. All right. Then I apologize. Um, but still, he'll have the opportunity if there's anything else he wants to seek to admit. Um, Mr. Diaz, uh, good morning. Uh, morning. Madam State Attorney Lopez, good morning. Good morning. And good morning. And Mr. Dirks, good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Diaz, you're standing. Does that mean you have something that you want to say? Just want to give the court a roadmap. We're going to read in the testimony of the five prior victims that we already admitted the transcripts of. We have our people here to serve as those witnesses effectively, and then we'll be putting on the two mothers. All right, excellent. So we'll start that way. I know that when we do it in front of a jury, there's an instruction or something, but I do not need the benefit of that instruction. I understand the law, and uh, this um, is over your objection, Mr. Lorenzo. The, so that is preserved for the record, but yes, what do you? What would you like to say at this time? Um, the state never actually put the legalities of why these people are unavailable. I asked that at one time, and it was never. It got run over. It kind of got lost. They never actually said why these people are unavailable to come in here. Um, we talked about other things. That I know, about. yeah, but it's come <coughs> up, Mr. Diaz. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the. Florida Evidence Code actually contains two provisions where former testimony may be used. One is the hearsay exception, even when the declarant is available. Is in fact available but as yes. a general rule, that is not usable by the prosecution in a criminal case. The other is when the declarant is unavailable. That is a, another potential option by which hearsay testimony could be admissible. However, uh, hearsay does not govern this particular proceeding as we're in a penalty phase. 921.141 governs instead, and it's clear that hearsay is admissible as long as the defendant has a meaningful chance to rebut whatever claims there are. As we stated before, Mr. Lorenzo had counsel in a full-blown trial in federal court 
They had every opportunity to confront those witnesses, and so the testimony is the testimony, and we believe that it is admissible under 921.141. All right, so, and, and I, I thought we had discussed that, or maybe it was research that we had done, I discussed with my staff attorney, but you were not seeking to admit it on the basis that any of those people who testified in the federal trial who you intend to read transcripts of today are in fact unavailable at this time, is that correct? I don't want to speak to each individual one because I didn't do the work. I know that some of them I think we had trouble locating or getting here, but we But that's know. not the basis that's not of the basis, your no. right. Okay. That's what I wanted to Okay, not a problem. Okay. And I guess just, just for, for the court's edification and for Mr. Lorenzo, we attempted to get all of them back. We discovered that two are deceased, that that one is is unlocatable in Spain, another one lives in California. That, that that we could not locate, another one lives in Indiana that we just could not get any response from and could not locate. So we wanted to bring all of them back. We, we got everyone we could. Well, I appreciate that. I'm not making a finding that they're unavailable because that's not, I, I would need more than those representations regarding their current status, uh, death certificates for those who uh, may be deceased. But um, apparently it's not necessary, and I agree uh, with you, Mr. Diaz, um, and Mr. Lorenzo, um, it is hearsay, but hearsay is admissible in this type of proceeding. This is not the guilt phase, um, and it is a penalty phase. It will ultimately go to what weight I give the evidence, and you certainly can argue to me um, to give it less weight because um, for whatever reason, right. but ultimately go to the weight I give it. It's admissible, but um, what weight I ultimately give it would be for me to decide. I do have, is there anything else, um, Mr. Lorenzo, before we get started today? No, I don't think so. We've got to bring, they're bringing the mothers in, right? And they've got to be able to do the, everything together. I think that that's what Mr. Diaz indicated after the reading. We'll see how long that <coughs> takes. But you have two live witnesses left who are the mothers of the two victims in this case. Yes, and even after yesterday's conversation, I've had a specific, I'm doing Ruth Wackles, for example. I'm going to do... Tell me about your son, tell me about the loss to you and your family, and then I will do the, what do you want to tell the judge to sort of clearly demarcate what I think would have been penalty phase testimony and what would have been Spencer hearing testimony. I appreciate that. Um, and Mr. Lorenzo, we discussed that yesterday. Have you had any change of heart on allowing them to testify as to both of those things when they testify? No, the mothers have waited 20 years to say their piece. I think they've waited a little bit. All right, I, I appreciate that. And I have something to say in light of uh, kind of that's a perfect segue that they've waited 20 years. And it's something that I'm currently doing research on. I'm thinking out loud here. I want to throw it out there. And it may require also something that I think <coughs> I'm still missing from the state. Normally, at the conclusion of the penalty phase proceedings where the state and the defense presents their um, evidence and testimony, the jury would be instructed and they would go out and they would deliberate and return a, 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 a verdict of, uh, on the sentence of life or death. So I really don't know why I am the jury in this case. I really don't know what would prohibit me. I know that there, you know, and we're trying to comply with a lot of very important case law from the Florida Supreme Court, particularly when mitigation is waived by the defendant and the court has an obligation to seek whatever mitigation may be out there and to weigh it. And which, what brings me to, there was a mitigation notice filed by Mr. Lorenzo on um, December 14th of 2021, which has a, a significant amount of stuff, you know, programs that he's completed, um, a number of things, which I intend to consider as, as mitigation. But in it, there's a reference to a mitigation packet that was submitted to the state in March of 2020. I think the state has an obligation, as we've discussed before, where I requested the sentencing um, uh, transcript from federal court, which I have. But I would like or, or like to hear why the state should not provide to me, and I would like it as soon as possible, the mitigation packet that was submitted. I, I recall that. I think Mr. Gonzalez prepared that. That's true. That would be correct. That's true. And it's now in the possession of the state. 
Why well, wouldn't? Why shouldn't under the case law where it says the state has the obligation to present to me any possible mitigation when the defendant waives mitigation, and you have a mitigation packet prepared by standby counsel, why shouldn't I have that in my hands before I make a determination and weigh aggravators and mitigators? Well, if Your Honor will indulge me, does Mr. Gonzalez still have that mitigation packet that he can just provide the copy? Except that the, the case law says that the state has to provide it. I just don't want... Can Mr. Gonzalez provide me a copy of the packet again so I don't have to go digging through the nine boxes to try to find it? That may work. It's a large... That'll work. It's a large three-ring binder. The problem is Mr. Lorenzo has instructed me not to provide anything to the state. Then it needs to come from the state. Well, Your Honor, we will attempt to find it. I don't know where that thing is at the moment to tell you that I could say I know exactly where it is. It's a large three-ring binder. You want me to come over to your office and look for a large three-ring binder? No, Your Honor. Obviously, we will undertake the effort to find it. I appreciate that. I'm just telling you at the moment I can't tell you that I know where it is to get it to. All right. Mr. Dirks is on his way. All right. I appreciate that. So I think it's something I need in my hands. And what I am telling you all is that at the conclusion of these proceedings, which I suspect may actually conclude today, I want each side to be prepared instead of writing a memorandum that is the normal procedure. But again, the normal procedure is not necessarily applicable here because I don't have a jury to be prepared to give some summary of an argument, closing argument, like you would do to a jury because I am the jury. I appreciate that. And Ms. Lorenzo, you would do the same. But I also have some questions for you because it's your rights that I am concerned about, your due process rights and all of that. What I am suggesting is then I will deliberate. If we go that route, I will deliberate. We were scheduled for all week, but I will have a number of things, including hopefully the three-ring binder to consider mitigation. And then we will come back to court tomorrow, and I will deliver my decision after thorough deliberation and consideration of aggravators, mitigators, and the weighing of those, which is the most important thing. What the Supreme Court requires that I do before I can consider delivering a sentence of death. So my question ultimately, it's my understanding also that we have not received, and when reading the sentencing transcript that was provided, it is not the full sentencing transcript from the federal proceeding. So we would like to have that as well. There's references to other things in the transcript that we have that were related to the sentencing. So if in fact that's correct, we would also like to get that sometime today so that I can consider that in any deliberations that I make tonight and through into the morning and tomorrow morning before I render a decision. But let me go back to you, Mr. Lorenzo. Mr. Lorenzo, you've heard what I've proposed, and I want to make sure that you don't have any reservations with that at all. If you do, then I will absolutely not hesitate to go ahead and have each side submit. I'll give you 45 days to submit a sentencing memorandum, which is normally how we proceed. And we normally only proceed that way if a jury, after deliberating, reaches a conclusion of death sentence. Then there's the opportunity for me, and then that's where we have the other hearing, and I consider the memorandums before I make a decision. As I've said, since you have removed the jury with my permission after a thorough colloquy with you, I think that we can go this way without running afoul of the Florida Supreme Court. But before I even consider – well, I am considering it – but before I would do that, I would want your input and to hear if you have any reservations or if you are all right with that. Technically, I would rather to wait so I can see what the state puts on paper. That's what I would prefer to see, to go ahead and see what their memorandum has to say. Well, let me – and just so there's – their memorandum, they would substitute a closing argument today. That would essentially be, for my purposes, their memorandum. 
So once all the evidence is closed and you've had the opportunity, I would turn to them and they're going to make their final argument to me, which you'll have the opportunity to listen to. And then you'll have the opportunity to make your final argument, which is any thoughts that you may have and any responses to what they've presented. Right. So we're doing it orally as opposed to having a written uh, document that would be submitted in 45 days. So I just want to make sure you understand all of that in making your decision. Right. I'd rather just stay the 45 days. That's what I prefer. But if it's going to make it easier for the court, no, 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 <laughs> um, no. I, I tell you what. I tell you what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. It's only something that I was considering and kicking around. I'm going to ask you to consider, think, to, to just to continue considering it. Because I really put you on the spot by just throwing that out there and asking you for an answer, and I apologize for that. Right. So I want you to continue to think about it. That's not a decision that we will need to have until the end of today, once the state is put in that. So you think about it. If you want to talk to standby counsel about it, if you have any questions of me about it, I'm happy to do that before we get to your final decision. Is that all right with you? That works good. Yes. All right, excellent. Yes. And in the meantime, the state is going to work on those documents that if, in fact, Mr. Lorenzo agrees, that I would need to consider tonight um, to weigh as potential mitigation. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. All right, so, Mr. Diaz, are we ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor, I won't be handling the next portion, but just if I could very briefly, I'd like to submit an evidence state to exhibit number nine. This is the certified copy of conviction for Mr. Lorenzo's 10 counts for which he was found guilty in federal court, uh, shown them to the defense. I don't right. need to have them. Any it. legal objection? Not at all. No. All right. Um, it'll be admitted in states 10, you said? Yes, Your Honor. Nine. 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 I'm sorry. States 10 is the flyer. And that's already been admitted. That was admitted yesterday. All right. So now we have states nine admitted. Yes, Your Honor. I would say call your first witness, but I think you're going to have people come down and read from the transcript. Who is, what is the name of the uh, first transcript? No, no, I will defer to my co-counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Assistant State, Account uh, Assistant State Attorney Kevin Riley for the record. The first witness, Your Honor, will be Stephen Leach, or excuse me, Joseph Leach. So he is um, actually uh, C eight. in state <coughs> eight. eight C is the transcript and someone is going to come down and read Mr. Leach's portion? That'll be ASA Sean uh, right behind me, Your Honor. Yes, All right, if you'll come on down, there's no need to swear you in. So, Your Honor, I will be being the prosecutor, Mr. Forcelli, and then additionally, I will be the defense attorney, Mr. Harrison, um, and then Mr. Crenshaw will be Mr. Leach. All right, welcome, Mr. Crenshaw. Um, as I said, normally there is a brief instruction that I would read to the jury, but uh, since I'm the jury, I don't believe that that's necessary, and I will just turn it over to you, Mr. Riley. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Leach. Good morning. If you pull the microphone a little closer to you. Sir, how old are you? 26 years old. If you can talk a little louder as well. 26 years old. Where do you currently reside? 3010 San Carlos Street. Is that here in Tampa, Florida? Yes. How long have you lived in Tampa, Florida? Almost 10 years. Mr. Leach, do you know an individual by the name of Steven Lorenzo? Yes. Can you explain to the members of the jury how long have you known the individual? Briefly for, well, I've known him for six years. How'd you first meet him? Through various friends at parties. When did you first meet him? Uh, probably, I'd say, the beginning of like 2000, somewhere around maybe the holiday season. How would you describe your relationship with him? He's somebody that I knew casually through other people. Mr. Leach, did you meet Mr. Lorenzo at a bar in November of 2000? Yes. Can you describe the circumstances regarding that meeting? I had walked in the bar. I was dropped off by there by my now ex-boyfriend, and he was the only person that I saw there that I had known, you know, previously, and we started to talk. What bar was this? It was called Metropolis. I'm going to show you what's been previously admitted as government exhibit number 99. Do you recognize that exhibit? That's the bar. That's the Metropolis bar you were at? Yes. Do you remember the exact date of this meeting? Not the exact date. Why is that? A lot of that time is kind of 
fuzzy. It's been five years. Did you have a converse, Did you have any conversation with the defendant? Just you know, brief, small talk at first. You know, nothing much to speak of. He asked me if I wanted to go out to his car and do some coke, and at the time, that was something that kind of seemed acceptable. You know, something that you know a friend, so to speak, would ask another friend to do. So I said, yeah. When you say coke, are you referring to cocaine? Yes. During that time frame, were you using narcotics? Yes. What types of drugs have you used? Well, during that time frame, I had done GHB before, I had done cocaine before, and I had smoked marijuana before. So the defendant offered you some cocaine and you accepted? Yes. Explain if you were drinking any alcoholic beverages that night. I had drank. I had one drink that I got to at the bar and then another drink before we went out to the car to do some cocaine. Prior to going out to the car to do this cocaine, were you drinking with the defendant? Yes. Okay. Before going out to do this cocaine, what did you do? I excused myself to go to the bathroom for a moment. Did you bring your drink with you? No. Where did you leave your drink? On the bar. With who? With the defendant. With the defendant? Yes. Did you come back out and finish that drink? Yes. Did you, can you recall anything different about that drink? No. Okay. Prior to these two drinks that you had at the Metropolis Bar that evening, had you had any other alcoholic beverages that evening? No. How did you leave the Metropolis Bar that evening? Well, we went outside to presumably go and do some cocaine in his car, and that was the last thing that I remember of that evening. What, is, what exactly is the last thing you remember? I remember sitting in his car, in his vehicle, with the door open, and then waking up however many hours later at his home. Okay. Do you remember if you had taken any cocaine? I do not remember. Is it fair to say you lost consciousness at that point? Yeah, I believe so. About what time in the evening was this? Oh, I would think that it would be kind of late because the bar itself wasn't very busy. So it would either be really late or really early. I have no idea. I can't remember. What do you remember when you regained your consciousness? I remember him being on top of me and telling him to get off me and I needed to go home. Who was on top of you? Mr. Lorenzo. Where were you? At his house, presumably. So you were no longer in the car? No. <coughs> you were in a room of some sort? Yes. Can you describe what type of room it was? I just remember there being a bed, you know. I remember there being a bed. It seems like his bedroom and possibly a door to the outside. I don't remember very much about it. Were you lying on the bed? Yes. Were you clothed? No. Was the defendant clothed? No. You say he was on top of you. In what type of fashion? Uh, he was lying on top of me with like my legs behind me so that he could have sex with me. I don't know really what you're asking. Were you restrained in any way? No, not that I remember. You said your legs were behind you. How were they positioned behind you? Like up over my head. Like, well, I don't really know how to describe that. My legs were pushed back so that I guess it would make sex easier. Was he pushing them back? Yes. Mr. Leach, you were consenting to this activity? No. At any time, did you indicate to the defendant you wanted to engage in intercourse with him? No. You said you had regular, uh, excuse me, you said you had regained consciousness. Did you lose consciousness again? I regained consciousness initially for a split second. I couldn't tell you what time or when it happened. I just remember kind of waking up out of a stupor and leaning forward and making sure that he was wearing a condom. And I saw that I believed that he was wearing a condom and I fell right back out again. The second time when I explained, when I regained consciousness was when I was actually aware enough to tell him to get off me and that I needed to go home. You said you were making sure he was wearing a condom. Again, were you consenting at this time? No, I literally, it was just the first thing that kind of went through my mind was, you know, what's going on and I couldn't piece together what was going on. I just knew that, you know, 
that there was, you know, sexual intercourse going on. And the first thing I could think was to make sure it was protected before I could even piece together how this happened or anything. So, but no, it wasn't consensual. Why didn't you fight back? I couldn't at the time. I mean, I literally, it, it was like my instincts going in just survival and being a gay man, my survival is pretty much relying upon safe sex in that type of situation. That was the only thing I could think about and I fell right back. It was like a hard just kind of pulling me back. You said you couldn't fight back. Can you describe what type of symptoms you were experiencing at that time? It was fuzziness. It almost felt like it wasn't even happening at the time. I remember kind of jerking up and looking down and seeing that he was wearing a condom and just falling right, you know, right back, backwards, you know? I don't even know what I could have done if he wasn't wearing a condom. I don't think I could have done anything. So you lost consciousness again. Did there come a time when you regained consciousness in this room? That was when I told him he needed to get off me. Describe how you were feeling at that time when you regained consciousness the second time. I just felt like something was wrong and that I needed to get out of there. I couldn't remember what had happened to bring me there. I couldn't remember, you know, anything of the previous night with the exception of, you know, that we were supposed to go and do some cocaine. So I didn't even start to, you know, really be able to focus on anything until I had gotten home much later that day. You said that you had thrown him off you this second time when you were gaining consciousness. Did you say anything to him? I told him he needed to get the fuck off me, part of my language. Were you angry with him? That I needed to go home, yeah. Did he say anything to you? He just told me to calm down and you know, what was the big deal, and I told him that he really needed to take me home because you know, I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. I really didn't know what to say to him. And I just told him that I needed to go. How did you get home that evening? He took me to my house. How did he take you there? Did he drive you? Yes. Did he take you specifically to your house? Yes, that I can remember. You had him drop you off at your residence. I believe so, yes. Did you go to the police about this matter immediately after it happened? No. Why not? I just think that they would really, that they would really particularly care. Mr. Leach, do you see the individual who did this to you in the courtroom? Yes. Can you point to him, excuse me, can you point him out and describe what he's wearing for the members of the jury? A gray suit and glasses. Your Honor, I'd ask the record to reflect. He has identified the defendant, and for record purposes, I'll be reading what the court has stated. The court stated the record will reflect, reflect that fact. I, as the prosecutor, as Mr. Fraselli, say nothing further. Now we move into the cross-examination. I will now be betraying Mr. Harrison. Question. Prior to this encounter with Mr. Lorenzo, had you contact with him before? I had met him a couple times before. He had been to your house before and partied at your house before, correct? Possibly. Now, 2606 and the Metropolis... These are bars that are considered to be pickup bars when people go to hook up for the night. 2606, more so than Metropolis, but yes. Would you also agree with me that the drugs seem to be pervasive in those two bars in particular? They can be. Party drugs in particular? They can be, yeah. Now, you used GHB prior to this incident? Yes. You've had used it about 20 or more times, correct? I wouldn't say that, no. Had you... How many times have you used GHB in your life? I'd say more than 10 and less than 20. Just out of curiosity, during the course of this investigation, were you presented before a grand jury to give testimony? Yes. And you're given testimony for the grand jury, correct? Yes. Now do you know what a G-hole is? Yes. What does this phrase mean to you? It's when you overdose on GHB and you're unconscious of your surroundings. You are unconscious or conscious? Unconscious of your surroundings. Can you usually, so, so you're really usually coherent when you're in a G-hole. You can hear what's going on, correct? It depends, I guess, on how much you've done. Okay, so you can hear the people talking about you sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. Would you describe this case as not being a G-hole, in other words? What you felt was not equivalent to a G-hole? 
I'd say that with what happened with me, that it's more, it was, well, I don't understand what you're asking. Are you saying if I've ever experienced a feeling like this before? You've experienced a G-hole feeling before. You've been in the G-hole feeling twice at least, correct? Yes. Then you have this feeling when you were with Mr. Lorenzo, correct? Yes. And they were different, weren't they? I wouldn't say they were completely different, no. I didn't say completely different, but they were different. Yeah, a little bit. You would agree with me that when you're in a G-hole, you can hear people around you and you're conscious? For a little while, yeah. In this case, you're saying it just, you lost everything. You lost the ability to move, you lost the ability to hear. You were just completely out, correct? Yes. Now let's go to the bar. How do you leave the bar? Presumably with Mr. Lorenzo. You don't recall leaving the bar? No, I just remember being in his car and then waking up at his home. You don't recall what color his car was? No idea. Do you know where he is, what the house looked like? Nope. Do you know if you went in the front door or back door? Nope. Do you know if you entered the front door or the back door? No. Nope. Or excuse me, do you know if you exited the front door or the back door? No. Nope. You would agree with me that when you left his house, you were in a cognitive state. You know what was going on, right? I knew I was getting out of there. Okay. You knew, I mean, you had the ability to push him away at that point, right? Yes. In fact, you had him when he did take you home. He didn't just drop you off anywhere. He dropped you off close to your house, correct? Yes. In fact, he dropped you off a couple blocks from your house, correct? I believe so, yes. He didn't drop you right in front of your house because you didn't want the members in the house to know what you and Mr. Lorenzo had just been doing. I didn't want Mr. Lorenzo to have an exact idea of where I lived. I thought you had previously testified he had been at your house party. He might have been. I lived with several people at the time. And it was your decision to have him drop you off several blocks away from your house. It was my decision to tell him to stop here and I would walk. And again, Mr. Lorenzo was engaged in sexual activity with you while wearing a condom, correct? I believe so, yes. And you didn't find anything physically wrong with you, didn't find any bruises, any type up, any bound? Nothing like that, no. Mr. Lorenzo, never. You don't have any recollection or any injuries to indicate that he had tied you up in any manner? No. You have nothing to indicate that he placed a mask over your face or duct taped you? No. How many times have you had an encounter with Mr. Lorenzo? Is this the only time or was there others? An encounter like this? Well, a sexual encounter if you will. That was the only time. For record purposes, the pro uh, Mr. Harrison states, if I can have a moment, Judge, the court says you may. Mr. Harrison continues with questioning. You would agree with me that you frequently party, if you will? At the time. What I mean by party, using illicit drugs? Sometimes, yes. Have you used cocaine? Yes. You used GHB in the past? Yes. You used what other drugs? Marijuana. I've used ketamine. I've used... Just to stop you, ketamine is referred to on the street as K. Special K, yes. Pills, MDMA. How about poppers? Poppers, yeah. I used poppers on a couple occasions. What is poppers to you? Poppers are, they're some type of video head cleaner. It's a solution that you sniff. I used it a couple times. I didn't really like it because it would give me a headache. How did you administer poppers? What'd you do? Smell the container? Squirt it or? <clears throat> you snort. You sniff the fumes of it, yes. Do you ever put it on a... bag of some sort, then breathe it off the rag? I've never done that. I've never done... Um, how about using a face mask? A gas mask type thing? No. Have you known other people to use this type of mechanism too. No. I have no further questions. For record purposes, the court says redirect. 
Now Mr. Purcelli takes over and redirect. Question. You said you wouldn't classify as what you experienced in a G-hole as entirely inconsistent. Let me ask you, have you experienced a G-hole? Yes. Describe what your experience was like. A couple of times that I've had an overdose of GHB, you kind of hear peripherals of things that people are saying, but you really can't do anything about it. You can't really defend yourself. The first time I ever fell into a G-hole, I was at a party and I'd woken up and had a sombrero on my head and somebody had drawn a mustache on my face and I had no idea any of this was going on. I had no idea that I had even gone into a G-hole until I started to come out of it and could hear people talking and kind of laughing at me and such. Let me ask you, when you experienced this, did you intend to go into a G-hole? At that time? Right. No. Did you understand how much dosage to give yourself to go into a G-hole? No, it was kind of, you know, you have somebody make you a cocktail, you drink it. If you don't feel anything, you drink another one. Sometimes you don't even give yourself enough time to feel the first one. When you were taking GHB, would you intend to take enough to have yourself completely pass out or lose consciousness? No. Nothing further. Record purposes, the court. Thank you, Mr. Leach. You may step down. All right, thank you. You may step down. Um. Your Honor, the next transcript that we read, I am not sure what it is on your exhibit list, but it would be Mr. Sergio Tube. Okay, that is uh, States 8B. And I will be playing the witness, and Mr. Travis Coy will be playing the prosecutor. Mr. Coy, good morning. Good morning, Judge. Come on down to the witness stand. Please watch your step. I'm just looking here. It is. I have the transcript here. Um, let me just take a look for timing purposes. That finished about 9.40. So just, uh, we started at 9.21. So that transcript took um, 19 minutes. Yeah, 19 minutes. So just for, for um, scheduling purposes, it looks like they're all about the same. So yesterday we had figured about 60 minutes, I think, based on some calculation. Um, it might be a little bit longer than that, but we're in, uh, we're in good shape. I think we're gonna get to the live witnesses, um, you know, shortly. We'll take a break after the transcripts. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, you all switched. Uh, yes, okay, we switched. not a problem. <laughs> Trying to confuse me there. Sergio, Sergio Itube, having, been, having first been duly sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, was examined and testified as follows. The clerk, please take a seat in the witness box. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Sergio Itube, I-T-U-R-B-E. Good afternoon, Mr. Itube. The court, excuse me a minute, Mr. Itube. If at any time you do not understand the translation, I'm sure you will understand it because he's one of our best. Mr. Arenas is, but if at any time you do not understand the translation, we raise your hand and let me know that. Yes, Sean. Sure. Mr. Tube, before we begin, let me ask you, do you understand English in some capacity? Yes, I understand. Your Honor, can I request that the interpreter use a microphone so it's audible with regard to the answers? The court, yes, give him the handheld. The interpreter, the interpreter will repeat, yes, I understand. But you have requested use of an interpreter because your Spanish, for lack of a, of a, excuse me, your English, for lack of a better term, is a little rusty? Yes, because I think I can explain it better in my native tongue. Mr. Otube, how old are you, sir? 27. Where are you currently residing? In Madrid, Spain. Is that your native country? Yes. Have you ever been to the Tampa Bay area before? Yes, I've been several times. In fact, didn't you attend college here in the Tampa Bay area? Yes, I attended St. Leo University two years, more or less. Okay, and do you recall what time frame that was? In the year 2001. What were you studying at the St. Leo College? Business Administration. Did you complete your degree at St. Leo? After I was, had the assault, I returned to Spain. I still had some credits to complete, and so I finished those four credits in Spain and returned for graduation. 
You said after you had an assault. What are you referring to, sir? The time I was raped. When were you raped, sir? November 9th, 2001. Do you remember that evening? I remember part of it. There was a time, a period of time, there where I was. They drugged me, and I don't remember, but I remember the before and after. Let's talk a little bit about that evening then. Do you know who did this to you? Yes, his name is Steven Lorenzo. Do you see that individual in court today? Yes, it's the individual over there. What is the individual wearing? A yellow tie. Your Honor, I'll ask that the record reflect he's identified the defendant, the court. The record will reflect the fact. Let's talk about how you came to contact with the defendant in November of 2001. Where did you meet the defendant? In a discotheque in Tampa. It's called 2606, I believe. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? The court. You may. Mr. Achube, I've just handed you what has been previously marked as Government's Exhibit 98. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. How do you recognize it, Mr. Achube? Because I remember the place. I remember it was there. I can identify it. Is that a photograph of 2606? Yes. And is that photograph a fair and accurate depiction of the entrance into 2606? Yes. Your Honor, I move Government's Exhibit 98 into evidence. Mr. Harrison, no objection. The court, it will be received. Thereupon, Government's Exhibit 98 was so designated for evidence. Let's publish number 98. Can you describe for the members of the jury how you met the defendant in November of 2001 at this bar, 2606? I arrived to this bar by myself. And first I met someone who was from Puerto Rico. And, I, and since he spoke Spanish like I did, he was the first person that I began to talk with. Then this individual began talking with Steven Lorenzo, and he introduced him to me as well. Do you remember this other individual's name that you're referring to? No, I don't remember. Did yourself, this other individual, and the defendant engage in any conversation at 2606? Yes, we spoke for some time, but right now I don't remember what we talked about. And were you talking in English during this conversation? Yes, a little bit of English and in Spanish with the other person. Describe to the members of the jury how you left 2606 on that evening. The defendant invited us to go to his house to have some drinks, and so I rode in Steven Lorenzo's car, and the other person went in his car. Where did you go? To Steven Lorenzo's house. Why did you go to the defendant's house? Because he invited us to have some drinks, and we accepted. We were going to have something to drink. Mr. Tuve, let me ask you, during this evening, at any time, did you have any conversation with the defendant regarding having sexual contact with the defendant? No, we never spoke about that subject ever. Did you give any indication whatsoever that you wanted to have sexual contact with the defendant? No, never. Mr. Tuve, have you ever engaged in any S&M or bondage type activity? No, never. On this evening that you met the defendant, did you indicate to him a willingness to participate in any such type of activity? No, no. How did you enter the defendant's residence on that evening? Well, we came in, I don't remember if it's the back door, through a kitchen, and then from the kitchen, we went like to the, I don't know, if it's the family room or the living room. Okay, when you say we, who are you referring to, Mr. Chuve? The young man from Puerto Rico, Steven Lorenzo, and myself. Can you describe what the the three of you were doing inside Mr. Lorenzo, Mr. Lorenzo's residence. When we arrived, he offered us some drinks, and we remained in the living room of the house drinking and talking. Did this other individual from Puerto Rico stay the entire time that you were there? No. He left before I did, because, no, I wasn't there by myself all the time, the... The interpreter, excuse me, the interpreter rectifies. The young man from Puerto Rico left after some time because Steven Lorenzo offered me a, what seemed to be like a pacifier, but it had alcohol. What do you mean by a pacifier? The expression means actually a shot. So the defendant offered you some type of shot. Did you assume that to be liquor? Yes. He told me it was a shot of liquor, some kind of alcohol, but when I had it, it didn't taste like alcohol. Was this shot given to you before or after the other individual who you believe to be from Puerto Rico left the residence? It was just shortly before he left the home. What happened to you after you, you drank this shot? Once I had that shot, I started to feel very dizzy and everything was turning around me. 
so I lay down. I threw myself on the sofa, and from that moment on, I don't remember anything well at all. How soon after that, you, after you took the shot, did you start to feel very dizzy? It was something pretty fast, really, about a minute or two, minutes after that or later. Mr. Tube, were you drinking that evening at the 2606 bar? Yes, I did have something to drink. Were they alcoholic beverages? Yes, they were alcoholic beverages. Do you remember approximately how many alcoholic beverages you had on that evening? I don't remember, but not too many. There wasn't too many. Do you think you were drunk on that evening? I had had something, some drinks, but not really to be drunk, enough to be drunk. What's the last thing you remember before you lost consciousness? I remember falling down or throwing myself on the sofa, and then Stephen Lorenzo did so after me. And from that moment on, I remember everything very poorly. Do you know how long you were out? No, but I know it was several hours, but I don't exactly or know exactly how much time. Do you remember anything at all during this time when you were unconscious? Yes, I remember several things. One of them is that I was, I felt something like electrical charge or some electrical shock in my legs. And I also remember turning my head and seeing Steven Lorenzo, who was behind me, and he was masturbating or something like that. Do you remember when you regained consciousness? Yes, when I gained consciousness, I was lying on the floor of the living room and I was completely naked and I felt really terrible. I was feeling very bad. What do you mean by that? I felt physically very, very badly. I felt like I was going to die. I had never felt that way before in my life. Were you experiencing any pain? Yes, I felt pain throughout my entire body and in my anus I also felt pain, so I knew that something had happened. Did you know how your clothes were taken off of you? No. When you woke up lying on the floor, was there anybody else in the room with you? Yes. Steven Lorenzo was behind me. He was behind me on the floor like he was hugging me. He was behind me hugging me. Did the defendant have clothes on at this time? Yes, he had clothes on. How was he clothed? He had sport-like slacks. I think it was gray. What were you thinking when you first regained your consciousness? I was very confused. I really didn't know what had happened. And I think I was still under the effects of the drugs because my head, my head felt terrible. I couldn't concentrate on any ideas. Did you realize at that time that something was wrong? Yes. At that point in time, I knew something had happened. I asked the defendant or told him that I wanted to lie down in bed. But when I tried to get up, I couldn't get up because my knees wouldn't hold me up. The defendant helped me to make it to bed because I couldn't do it on my own. Why didn't you just try to get out of the house at that time? It would have been totally impossible. I couldn't. I wouldn't have been able to do it on my own. Do you know how long you were on the defendant's bed for? When I was on the defendant's bed, by that I was conscious, awake, and I started realizing all the things that had happened. Then there was a point in time that I went to the bathroom, and when I was in the bathroom, I was able to see all the wounds that, or lesions, that I had on my body. What type of lesions or wounds are you talking about? I had like a scar on the penis and a couple of burn marks in between my legs. And then on my wrists and ankles, there were signs that I had been tied somehow. Mr. Tube, did you notice if any part of your body had been shaved? Yes, I was shaved in my underarms, all on my chest, and all the area around the penis as well. Mr. Tube, when you were in the bathroom, and identify these injuries to your body, what were you thinking at that time? At the time, at that time, was when I finally realized everything that had happened to me. And at that time, I was really scared because I wasn't able to handle myself alone. And I saw that I was with a very dangerous person. So from that moment on, what I did was that I behaved in front of him as if nothing had happened. And the only way that I saw that I'd be able to leave the house was because my knees felt very weak. And I asked him if he could take me to the hospital because that is my only way of being able to leave that house. Did you convince the defendant to take you to the hospital? Yes, I convinced him to take me and I mentioned primarily the knees. I didn't mention anything about the other parts of my body where I had been harmed. Why didn't you mention the other parts? Because I felt that if, they were, if that were the case, he could become violent with me. And so I pretended that that was the only thing that had happened to me that it was my knees and that it wasn't that I wasn't angry with him about anything else because I feared. 
Do you remember the drive to the hospital with the defendant? Yes, I remember leaving the house on my hands and knees because I wasn't able to walk. And once I was in the defendant's car, he was talking to me about the fact that he wanted to take me out to dinner that night. And at that time, I realized that he was a person totally, that he didn't realize what he had done to me, and I became more fearful of him. What happened when you got to the hospital? Well, when we arrived to the hospital, I signed in as claiming I had a problem with my knees. And once I was in there and I was waiting to be admitted, I was with, he was with me all the time. And then once I was inside, then I went inside by myself. A nurse saw me and I showed her all the wounds that I had. And then she told me she was going to inform the police so that I could make a statement. Mr. Tube, in the beginning of your testimony, you said that this incident caused you to return to Spain. How soon after this incident did you return to Spain? Well, I really don't remember the exact amount of time, but I don't think I was here more than a week, or maximum two weeks after this assault happened. Mr. Tube, in your opinion, what happened to you on that evening in November of 2001? Well, first of all, that I was drugged and that I was also raped, but I would call it more than that, a brutal attack. Mr. Otube, who did this to you? Steven Lorenzo. Nothing further. The court, cross-examination by Mr. Harrison. Mr. Otube, before you went back to Spain, how long had you been a student at St. Leo College? Well, I'm actually a total of two years. Do you remember how many credit hours you had completed at that point? No, I don't remember exactly, but I do remember that all I had left was four classes, four to eight. Classes left for graduating in order to graduate. How many total classes did you need to graduate? The entire career, for the entire career. You said you needed four to eight classes to complete it. I'm asking you, how many total classes did you need to be completed? Well, the total amount for the entire career, I don't remember exactly right now. I don't remember how many classes. It's been five years since I finished my career. One of the things you said on direct examination is they drugged me. Who is they? No, I wasn't referring to it as plural. I meant singular. I believe that I was drugged by one person specifically, and that was Steven Lorenzo. You have no recollection of Mr. Lorenzo tying you up, do you? No. You have no recollection of Mr. Lorenzo striking you, do you? No. You have no recollection of Mr. Lorenzo in any way violating your body, do you? The reason why I believed it was him is because the only time that I regained consciousness for a moment, I remember seeing him behind me and he was masturbating. But the question I ask you is, you don't recall Mr. Lorenzo ever violating you? No. Let's back up for a minute. On this particular night, you met an individual by the name of Emilio, correct? Right now I don't remember, but I suppose that is the young man from Puerto Rico that I mentioned. Okay. Just for the sake of our conversation, the Puerto Rican man and Emilio being one and the same individual, okay? Yes. And where did you meet this man at? At a discotheque, 2606. And then at some point, you left 2606 and went to the metropolis. Yes, we went from one place to another, but right now I don't remember exactly. With this young man, I don't remember. But at some point, you entered in an automobile and you went to Mr. Lorenzo's house. Yes and you went over there, Emilio followed Mr. Lorenzo in, this, in his vehicle to Lorenzo's house, correct? Yes. So it was Emilio who took you over there, not Mr. Lorenzo. No, I got in Lorenzo's car and Emilio followed us in his. So how many times during your contact with Mr. Lorenzo had you been in his vehicle? One time, the trajectory between the discotheque and his house. So in your total contact with Mr. Lorenzo, how many times had you been in his vehicle? Only that time. Well, weren't you in his vehicle? So you only have been in his vehicle one time? In Lorenzo's, yes, one time. And that, in fact, was a trip to the hospital, wasn't it? Oh no, yes, you're right. It really was two times. One time from the discotheque to his house and a second time from his house to the hospital. Had you been drinking throughout the night? Yes, I have been drinking, but I don't know the exact amounts. But it's what I said before. It wasn't a whole lot. Then when you got to Mr. Lorenzo's house, you continued your drinking. Yes. And that you, Emilio, 
or this Puerto Rican gentleman and Mr. Lorenzo engage in taking shots from a small cup or glass? No, the shots we only had with Mr. Lorenzo and myself. Before that, we were drinking something different. I don't remember if it was drinks or a glass of wine. You keep using the pronoun we. Are you referring to yourself, this Puerto Rican gentleman, and Mr. Lorenzo? Yes, the three people. At some point through the night, you become groggy or losing some consciousness of what was taking place, correct? Uh Uh-huh, yes. And at that point, you weren't bound or harmed? No. And the next thing you recall is waking up in Miss Lorenzo's living room with your knees and other injuries that you believe took place during the interceding time. Yes. Then at some point, Mr. Lorenzo got you, got you off the floor and assisted you into his bedroom. Yes. That was when I began to wake up again or to recover consciousness. And once you regain your composure, if you will, from a mental uh, acuity standpoint, Mr. Lorenzo, during that period of time, he never battered you or in any way tied you up or bound you, did he? Once I recovered, no. Not in that at that moment. And in fact, during the course of your stay there, Mr. Lorenzo even tried to get you to eat some food, did he not? I don't remember. Now, as far as this, one of the things you talked about was this electrical shock or shock to your legs. Do you recall your testifying on to that on direct examination? Yes. Now, when you say electrical shock, are you talking about like a shooting type of pain or are you talking about somebody applying some type of electrical device well in reality what the only thing that i felt was like some electrical discharge or discharges but it actually even woke me up because i was unconscious but i'm asking is this electrical discharge is it because there was some type of device attached to your body well i really don't know because i was unconscious the only thing that i can remember is that the feeling that i had and the fact that it even made me recover my consciousness for a moment because I was unconscious. At some point, I'm going to change gears here. Did you drive to these bars from your home or apartment? Yes. At some point, you abandoned your automobile by getting into someone else's, correct? Yes. And then the following morning, in this early morning hours towards the afternoon, when you became conscious, if you will, of what was happening to you and you found yourself at Mr. Lorenzo's house, Didn't you ask Mr. Lorenzo to take you back to your own car? No. At that time, my vehicle wasn't something I was worried about at all. I wasn't worried about it. And in fact, when when Mr. Lorenzo took you to the hospital, he he assisted you into the hospital, did he not? Yes. And he stayed there while you continued to get medical treatment, did he not? Well, that I really don't know because once I was admitted inside, from that moment on, I never saw him again until today. At some point, then you made contact with law enforcement at the hospital. You recall that? Yes, the nurse. Right after she saw me, she said was going to call an agent, a police officer, so that I could explain to him what had happened, everything that had happened. And do you recall whether this officer was Officer Shearer, S-H-E-A-R-E-R? Right now, no. I don't remember the name. (coughs) Coming to court today. How many times have you talked to law enforcement or the U.S. Attorney's Office or the State Attorney's Office relating to this event? The times that I have spoken to the police was, the first time was in the hospital, and then after that, I went to a treatment center, I think it's a center for treatment in rape cases. And then, a couple of days later, my friends came and picked me up, but I had to contact the officer because I left some clothes at the hospital. And then, when I saw the agent, the officer, I spoke with him a little bit more about this case. If I can stop you there for just a second. You were saying when the agent spoke to you. When was that? When did this agent speak to you? Was it, some, was it something recent in 2005? No. When I spoke with the officer, it was in the hospital. And then the next day or two days after I spoke with him again. Let me try and narrow this down a bit. In 2005... How many times have you had contact with either lawyers investigating this case or law enforcement investigating this case? Yes. In 2005, I have had contact with Scott. I believe his name is Scott. 
and officers of what is the Drug Enforcement Agency. Did you talk to these individuals today before court? Yes, I said hello to them. Did you speak to any of them yesterday? Yesterday, yes. Now, there have been no arrests prior to Ms. Lorenzo's recent arrest in 2000 relating to this incident involving yourself, correct? In other words, if I can sh strike that. The police did not arrest anybody back in 2000, correct? No, at that time, I tried to contact the authorities. I wanted to try to get something on him. I came in contact with the lawyer, the university lawyer, but they told me that the case was being, it was closed and that they were not proceeding with it. And then from that moment on, I saw I had a really nothing left to do since the case was closed. Getting back to this, didn't in fact law enforcement and U.S. Attorney's Office representatives come to Spain to speak to you back in 2005, earlier this year? Yes, they contacted me several times and they came to see me in Madrid. And the purpose of coming to see you in Madrid is because they wanted you to testify against Mr. Lorenzo, correct? Yes. And they shared information with you about other things that Mr. Lorenzo is alleged to have been involved in. The only thing they said to me was that there had been more cases after mine, and they went to see me because they wanted to come, they wanted me to come and testify here in the United States. If I can have a moment, Your Honor, the court, you may. Brief pause. No further questions, Judge. The court redirect Mr. Purcelli. None, Your Honor. The court. Thank you, sir. May he return to Spain? Mr. Purcelli. Yes, Your Honor. The court. Thank you. You're free to return to Spain. Thank you. Thank you. You may step down. We can proceed to the next two. Uh, which transcript do you intend to read at this time? Mr. Joey Alba, Your Honor. Joey Alba, who is uh, States 8A. Thank you, Judge. Joey Alba have been first been duly sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, was examined and testified as follows. The clerk, please take a seat in the witness box. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Joey Alba, J-O-E-Y-A-L-B-A. -E Good morning, Mr. Alba. Hello. Where do you live, sir? Me right now? Yes. On North Himes Avenue. Where is that located? On 5510 Courtney Cove Apartments. Is that here in Tampa? Yeah. How old are you, Mr. Alba? 24. How are you currently employed? Right now I'm working with my boy, John House. We do, we sell uh, skin products for micro, dermabrasion, and all that other stuff. Did you ever earn a living as, for lack of a better term, a street hustler? Yeah, I used to. I used to hustle in Orlando, Lake Eola. When I came down to Tampa, I was hustling on Kennedy Boulevard in Kiki's and Metropolis in 2606. What do you mean by hustling? Sucking dicks, wanting crack, and all that other good stuff that goes along with it. You would do that for money? Yeah. How long were you doing that, sir? For about four or five years. You said also smoking crack. Were you doing other drugs as well? Crystal meth, and GHB, ecstasy, weed, heroin. Have you ever been convicted for any drug charges? Yeah. Possession of drug paraphernalia, possession of crack cocaine, possession of that's about it. Throwing a deadly missile charge. Okay. We'll talk about that one a little further. What do you mean throwing a deadly missile charge? When I went back to his house, I was listening to see if anybody was screaming or anything, and I heard him by his computer, and I just picked up the biggest rock I could and threw it through his window. When you say his house, who are you referring to? Steve Lorenzo. Well, let's back up. Do you know Steven Lorenzo? Yeah, I do. How do you know Steven Lorenzo? Met him at 2606, a leather bar. Do you recall when the first time it was when you met him? I don't remember exactly when it was, but when I met him, I was talking to these other guys, and I was all messed up. 
I was walking upstairs, downstairs, seeing if I could get any money drinking. Then I ran into him and he said, hey, do you want to party? So I said, yeah, why not? Okay. And he told me he had crystal meth. We did some Tina. We did a little bit. I think the first night we met, he had G already. We did a little bit of G and stuff like that. And then we just partied. He acted fine. He didn't act like he was really the person he is now. He didn't act like he had the kind of mentality to where he could do that to somebody. You say, where did he did this to you? What are you referring to? What do you mean? You said the way he could do something to you. What are you indicating? Well, the way he acted when I first met him, he must have like a double personality or something maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not a psychiatrist. But he could really play the game if he really wanted to hurt somebody like that. How many times did you meet Mr. Lorenzo? About five or six times. I used to go to his house either in the afternoons or in the mornings. He'd cook, he'd cook me uh, freaking chili or something. We'd do crystal meth and play around a little bit. He'd throw me some money and then I'd leave. Did there come a time where your relationship changed with the defendant? Oh yeah. Okay, can you explain those circumstances? Well, after we met for a couple of days, freaking well, first of all, when I started going to his house again and again, I started telling him that I had a girlfriend. She was transsexual and then I wanted to get her off the streets. He started becoming maybe like my friend at first, that's what I thought. But then it came close to Christmas time and he had like a Christmas tree. This is the night that this happened to me. He had like a Christmas tree in his house. And what else? Was this around Christmas of 2002? I don't remember if it was exactly on Christmas or way before Christmas or after Christmas. All I remember is he had a Christmas tree up. That's what I remember now. Are you talking around December of 2002? I think so. Well, explain what happened then. Well, he took me to his house and then he started, we started smoking some. No, first of all, I was walking down Kennedy Boulevard and I'd seen him in a car and he tells me, do you want to get $200 worth of crack? Or you could just leave. Don't get the crack and you can just go on your own way. So to that right there, that to me right there sounded a little bit weird. I said, all right, fuck it, I wanna go smoke. He told me, so I get back in the car and we go back to his house and we started smoking and drinking. And then? What were you smoking? Crack cocaine. What type of high do you get from crack cocaine? Sometimes when you're with a guy, it makes you horny and not think about what you're doing at the same time because you'd be watching the straight porn or whatever. Would you describe as it gives you energy or? No, it just kind of, kind of, it's like almost like taking a pill. Okay, you said you had some drinks with him as well. What type of drinks? I don't remember, but he was making me some mixed drinks, but I always watched him pour the drinks, so I, I was like that anyway. But when he made the drinks, I remember us talking because it was getting close to Christmas time and I told him that I wanted to try to get my girlfriend and that I was tired of doing this and all these other crazy things. He told me that he had a friend that if you take a crazy video one day, like you get all kinky on it and they tie your arms up, that you can get paid five or $500 or $600. And I remember asking him that night, hey, do you wanna pay me? Do you want to do this? And he was like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And he said, don't worry about it, that a guy. He knows a friend in the industry and all the other stuff. And then I remember that the last drink he gave me, you know, I didn't feel nothing yet, but I was feeling pretty messed up. And he goes, come on, are you ready? And I said, yeah. So we're sitting in the living room and what we do is we go back to the back room. He has a camera set up and everything. I said, all right, I'll do it. He said, there's going to be hand tying involved. I didn't know anything about the feet. Did you agree to have your hands tied? Yeah, for money and pictures and videos, yeah. I don't remem remember if I signed any papers on whether or not we were going to do the video or not, or not, but I remember it was supposed to be part of it. Then as he started tying my first arm, I started feeling wheezy, like I was about to, something was going on, the second arm. By the time he had my foot in there, I couldn't get out. And I say, hey, what are you doing? Did you want to get out? 
course. Did you tell him to stop? Yeah, I told him to stop. But you know what? I don't remember. Towards the end, all I remember was passing out. All I remember was facing away. Once he had my legs and I was trying to fight, I guess when you do H GHB, because I used to go to parties and after hours, and once you go into a G-hole, there's just nothing. And I got raped before in Orlando, so. Did you think you were in a G-hole at this time? Yeah. Why do you say that? Because I know what GHB feels like because I used to do it a lot in parties. I've been in a G-hole and woke up pissed on myself. So I basically know the effects of it and how you feel when you wake up. Did you take GHB that night knowingly? No. How do you think you got it? You must have slipped it in there somehow. You said you had agreed at some point to have your hands tied. What made you change your mind? What made me change my mind about that? Why did you want it to stop? Well, once you're getting your hands tied and it's not willingly anymore, just like when you sign a contract to do anything, right? You gotta play by the rules. Do you remember at all what happened to you after you lost consciousness? Well, I remember waking up on the bed all messed up. What do you mean by messed up? I couldn't get up. I don't know. I don't remember if I had my face. No, nothing happened to my face at that time. I think I woke up with nothing on my face at that time. All I remember, or I might have had <clears throat> some tape on me, I don't remember. But I didn't have all that. When Officer Columbia showed me that mask, I don't remember having a mask on me, to be honest. All I remember was being able to see through a little spit, split in my eye. And I think he knew because he was looking at me right in, the, in that eye. You just indicated that Officer Columbia showed you some pictures. Yeah. Were you aware of those pictures prior to him uh, showing you those pictures? No. Had you ever seen them before? No. Okay. I'm going to ask you to look at some of them today. Let's start off with government exhibit number 85-B, which has been previously admitted into evidence. There's a screen in front of you. You can look at the screen in front of you, Mr. Alva, right? Actually right there in front of you. Can you tell us who that is in the picture? Yeah, that's me. Were you aware of what was happening at that time? No. Let's look at 85-H. Who is that in that photograph? That's me. We see your hands bound to the bed. Did you consent to have that done to you at that time? No. Were you aware that was happening to you? When I woke up, I was. Let's look at 85-I. If you could see closely there, it appears that your eyes may be somewhat open. Do you remember that at all? It kind of looks to me like I'm unconscious or something. Well, let me ask you again. Do you remember that? No. Looking at 85-J. Can Could we see, we, oh, sorry. Could we see those pictures also over there? Mr. Alba, if you could just answer the questions. All right. Looking at 85-J, there appears to be a binding on your penis. Did you consent to that? No. Were you aware that that was happening to you? No. Let's look at 85-L. Sir, who is that in the photograph? That's me. Do you recognize that tattoo? Yes. We see what appears to be duct tape on your ears and somewhat on your face. That's what felt like was on my face, but I don't remember feeling the leather or anything like that. It appears to be a gas mask on your face. Do you remember that at all? No. Did you consent to that at all? We also see there appears to be plastic binding around your body. Do you remember that? No. Did you consent to that? The court, can you answer yes or no, please? No. Looking at 85-M, sir, is that you also in this picture? Yes. Do you remember any of this? I remember waking up tied up like that. So there came a point where you do remember waking up and you were bound? Yeah. Did you discuss anything with the defendant when you did regain consciousness? Yeah, I was telling him him what was going on and I was trying to ask him why he had me like this I was cursing I was pretty mad at first then I think I struggled to break loose of him so much that I was just crying myself to sleep again basically and waking up looking at this guy right here 
What were you thinking at that time? Jumping out of a window. Could you jump out of a window? No, I tried to jump out of something, I don't know. Because every time I tried, he would grab me or something. Did you attempt to fight back at all? Yeah, I was trying to struggle my way out of it, but I couldn't. He's a pretty big guy. Did you tell him to stop? Yeah. Did he stop? No, he smacked me on my head real hard. Did you suffer any injuries as a result of this? Oh yeah, when I woke up, I felt dizzy to the point where I couldn't even... By the time this was all done, when he took all that off of me, I felt like I was going to pass out, basically. Well, explain how that happened. You said he took it off of you. How did it get to that point? Well, I remember he kept telling me because I don't know how long I was there approximately. I don't, I really don't know, but I know it was a very long time. I kept getting scared because he kept telling me that this guy was going to come over and I'm thinking in my head, oh, this guy is going to kill me. He said, my friend is going to be here in a little while, so don't worry about it. I said, what are you talking about? Who did you think was going to kill you? Him and his friend. He said, don't worry, you're going to be all right, you're going to be all right, like talking like he was nuts or something. And I kept, I remember towards the end of everything, I started praying to God and I was just telling him, somebody knows where I'm at and you know, I am start, started telling him that I love him and all that kind of crazy stuff because I thought I was going to die. Why did you tell him that? I was scared. I figured someone this crazy, I guess if you try to get someone somewhat deepness out of him, who knows, he might be a crazy cold guy, but I was just trying to find a way to resolve getting out of that situation. I must have had an angel with me that day because I thought I was going to die. I'm being serious. Mr. Alva, you seem to be looking over here in one direction ever so often. Do you see Mr. Lorenzo in the courtroom? Yeah. Can you point him out and describe what he's wearing? Right there, he's got a gray suit, glasses. Is this the individual who did these things to you? Yep. Let me ask you, when you lost consciousness, is it possible you could have lost consciousness from smoking the crack cocaine? No, I've smoked six, seven hundred dollars worth of crack cocaine and never went unconscious. It felt like I was going to have a heart attack sometimes, but I never went unconscious. I'd be up for days. In your opinion, how did you think you lost consciousness? From GHB. That's based upon your prior experience with GHB? Yeah. I've been doing drugs for a very long time, so I basically know how GHB makes you feel. I know every type of drug in the book, basically. Not everyone, but... After this ended, did you immediately report it to the police? No. How soon after this happened to you? Actually, after this all happened, we went to Taco Bell and had something to eat. Who did you go to Taco Bell with? With this guy. Is that the defendant? Yeah, I was trying to get some more money off of him because I wanted to smoke, but he gave me money anyway. We talked about him giving me money for the video and all that stuff. But at that point, I was so pissed off that I just wanted to go smoke. I didn't have the energy to either. I just didn't care. I can't believe how I walked in this restaurant. When I, because when I was looking at the cashier, she was looking at my face and I must have still had duct tape on my face, which I tried to stub off in his house with some paint thinner. You mean the remnants from the duct tape? Yeah. Did there come a time that you did report it to the police? Yeah, I met with this drag queen on. I met with this drag queen one time in, in Kills, and I think I hustled with her, and she's rich, real rich. She got a big house, Bentley, Rolls, uh, Royce, all that. And I remember trying to hustle that night. I was smoking, but I felt like disgusted that night. I don't know why, because she's an ugly thing anyway. But then I went to that person's house. I started explaining because she becomes more of like my friend because she really didn't want to do anything with me at that time because she seen that I didn't really want to do anything with her. I started speaking to her about what happened. I think this is the first time I let it out and I was crying and I was pissed off. I was telling her I was worried about it because I didn't know if he had anybody else in that place. All I remember is when this all finished, I used to think about like kids screaming and other kids trying to run away from this, this guy right here. And something told me that I had to tell somebody. I wasn't going to at first because he told I don't even know why I felt this way. Maybe it was the crack and all the stuff at the time. 
but he told me his grandfather was a judge and all this other stuff. He looks like the Italian type, so I thought maybe he was in the mob. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. You know what I mean. When you're me messing around with drug people like that, you never know who could be involved in what, you know? How did you go about reporting it to the police? Well, I told her, and she was kind of scared to call the police. She said, I'm going to call the police, but I don't want to tell them my name because I don't know if they wanted to know. I don't know if she wanted them to know if she was a drag queen or what, or what was going on. But she called and called it in just to see if the cops would go by his house to see what was going on. We stayed in the corner of the block watching the cops go to his house. We watched, and they kept going in the back. And I guess he was scared to open the door because he didn't answer it for about a good half an hour. There must have been a reason why, you know. Did you meet with the cops on that day? I think I did. Did you ever follow up to make sure that? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. You did. Did you ever follow up after that to make sure something was done? I was supposed to, man, but I was drinking so much and I was smoking so much that I just didn't want to follow back, follow back up with the cops. Because, you know, I was just messed up in the head. You know what I mean. I was going through a lot of stuff at that time. Basically, I wanted to follow up, and somebody told me to. But it was just like I felt cold and colder, you know? After this, did you have any other contact, or did you ever go back to the defendant's residence? Yeah, with my ex-girlfriend, the transsexual I used to go with. She's from Kuwait. Her name is Jessica Albazide. Do you remember, and we talked a little about this in the beginning of your testimony, this conviction you have for throwing a missile, what was that in regards to again? I went to his house and I was basically pissed off because I told my girlfriend and she said, well, let's go fuck. Let's go see this guy. And actually, I'm the one who drove over there. So when I drove over there, I was hearing him by the window. I heard him on the window, and then I don't know how far he was from the window. All I heard was him inside talking, talking to a friend and laughing or something like that. So I looked on the floor and I looked at the biggest thing I could find and I just threw it through the window. Did you throw it through the window because you were angry as to what happened? No, wait up, wait up, wait up. I remember there being a point where I came to his house and I knocked on the back door and he opened up and he looked me in the eye. Then I opened the door and he got scared because I felt like beating him up. He got scared and he's a pretty big guy, but I didn't care that day. I would have hit him, believe me. I think the only reason why I didn't hit him when I woke up was because I was so drugged up. But as big as he was, I think I would have gotten him. I know I would have gotten him because I was heated, bro. You were angry as to what happened to you? Yes. I asked him, I said, do you remember what happened? He goes, what are you talking about? My ex-girlfriend started talking and looking in the face and he was trying to avoid what happened that night. He goes, no, 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 I don't remember none of that. He was pretty scared though, because he ran back in the house and said, I'm going to call the cops. He wasn't so tough then. And you threw a rock or a brick through his window? It was like a boulder, little rock, little boulder. Did you get arrested for that? Yeah, three months later. When you got arrested, did you tell law enforcement why you did it? Yeah, I told them. You pled to that? Huh? You pled to that charge? Yeah, I don't know if I pled no contest or guilty, but I pled to that charge. Somehow I got a deal somehow. I think they either gave me probation or something. I don't remember. I know it's a second degree felony. They say it's punishable for about 15 years, but I don't know if that's true or not, you know? You said when you got arrested for throwing this rock through his window, did you tell the arresting officers why you threw the rock through the defendant's window? No, because when I got caught, I got caught in a car. I think that day I was smoking and they pulled me over the cop and he said, you got a warrant out for your arrest. And then I knew what it was basically about. So you got arrested sometime thereafter? Yeah. You may have a moment, Your Honor. The court, you may. Brief pause. Nothing further, Your Honor. The court, cross-examination by Mr. Harrison. Good morning, Mr. Alva. Good morning. Mr. Alba, you said you were a street hustler. 200 for a street hustler is a pretty good day. Would you agree? Yeah, it is. And this happened to support your drug habit, correct? Yep. What are you talking about? The 200. The 200 
that what? To help support your drug habit. This is what you agreed to do with Mr. Lorenzo, right? Oh, no, no, no. He told me that he was going to pay me like five or six hundred to do a video. Did he, did he pay you any money? He slipped. He gave me a hundred bucks. Okay. And that didn't sit well with you? Not really. Would it sit well with you? And you continue for years after this to have a drug problem, correct? Of course. Do you still think you have a drug problem today? No. Do you know when the last time was that you used illegal drugs? Illegal drugs? Uh, about maybe a month ago, month or two months ago. So you haven't used any type of drugs in the last 30 days? I might have smoked a joint here or there. But you do agree, and your testimony was that you were watching Mr. Lorenzo pour you these drinks? Yeah, I was. And you agree that he, you were walking down Kennedy? Yeah. And you flagged him down, and he... I was basically looking for a trick. And he, you knew he was when he passed by you. Did you not? Of course. You wanted, I'm sorry, you waved him down and he turned around and came back to you. Yeah. He said, hey, how about some videos? How about some pics for 200? No, we didn't start with all that. All he said was, here's 200. Can you get some dope? And I said, yeah, I can get some dope. He goes, you can either take this $200 and leave, or you can bring back the dope and come to my house. So he didn't put any, you're saying he did not put any type of conditions on his 200. Just, I'm going to give you 200 and you can do whatever you want to do with it. No, because when we met, he basically acted like he was a person who just wanted to hang out with me. And pay you 200 for no reason. Did he what? He was going to give you 200 just because he liked you, right? No, he probably wanted to suck my dick or something. So he was going to pay you money so he can do that to you? He was going to pay me money to do the video you're, talk you're talking about. Is that what you're asking me? No, sir. I'm asking, what was your understanding of why he was paying you 200 or any amount of money? 200 was for the crack. But why is he giving you money for crack? Because he's a crackhead. Okay. Now, at some point... You were saying that you went back to Mr. Lorenzo's house. That would have, that would have been around that would have been about June of 2003. I don't remember exactly when it was. I know I went back to his house. You went back with this trans this transsexual friend of yours. I think the first we went back was with her. I don't remember, but I remember going back to his house and going to the back door first and me confronting him about the whole situation. When Mr. Purcelli said, why did you go back? The two of you go to Miss Lorenzo's house. You said, let's go fuck, and then you stop. Let's go what? Your response was, let's go fuck, and then you stop. I was planning on beating him up. So you were going over there to fuck him up, weren't you? I was basically mad, yeah. But you stopped yourself there. You just said, let's go fuck, then you stop. Because I don't want to be rude in court. But your intention was to go over there and cause harm to... No, my intention was to listen to him. To listen to me. Let me stop for a second. The court, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Mr. Alva, let him ask the question. You answer it to the best of your ability, all right? All right. The court, and things will go smoothly. Plus, Miss Fry will be able to accurately re record what is said. The witness. All right. The court. Go ahead, Mr. Harrison. So you went there because you were going to cause harm to Miss Lorenzo, correct? I was going to confront him, and then, yeah, I was planning on beating him up. When you picked up the rock, he closed the door, and you smashed it into the window, correct? No, I picked up the rock, and I threw it through the window because I was pissed off. But when he opened the back door, when we talked, then I was, yeah, I was going to beat him up. But the rock wasn't the only thing you threw. You threw a number of items at the door. Did you not? At the house? No. First, the rock was just going through the window. When I went to the back, then he opened the door up and I tried to get in. And then he tried to grab the phone. And then sooner or later, he got the door closed somehow and I left. And you struggled to break free once. Eventually, you were tied up. You remember that part? I remember being tied up, yeah. You were shown some photographs of you lying on the bed. Do you remember that part? 
while I was in his house. While you were in his house? No, bro. Do you remember a part, other pictures other than what was shown, or is that all the pictures that you are aware of? All I remember is being tied up and being able to see through a little uh, slap through the duct tape. Duct tape. That's all I remember. If we can do 85-I. Mr. Alva, if you look at the photograph in front of you, sir, do you know what this item is right here? Yeah, a crack pipe. You have been smoking crack that day, correct? Yeah. Obviously, you weren't smoking crack with your hands bound like that, were you? No. So apparently, before your hands got bound, you are sitting in his bed smoking crack. No, we were smoking crack in the living where the Christmas tree was at. Somehow, you weren't smoking crack at all inside? He must have been smoking it while he was doing all this to me. I don't know if your photo, you may need to turn and look behind us. In this air, area, right here, there appears to be some type of rash or injury. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that. Okay, isn't that in fact a rash? No. Do you know what that is? I don't know what it looks like a bruise to me. Now, did you get, if you notice the hands being tied right there, did you get any injuries to your hands, your wrists? I had marks all over, man. I had a lot of reddish stuff, mostly all by my head. Did you document those injuries? No. Did you call the police and say, this is what happened to me? No. In fact, even after you got arrested for throwing this stuff into Miss Lorenzo's house, you didn't tell them, the reason why I did it is because he did this to me. Because I was smoking that day and they basically got me on a warrant, so I didn't want to speak to nobody without a lawyer, because I'm not, you know, I'm not dumb like that. And then, after this whole scenario is over with, you go into the bathroom and you clean up, to get the duct tape glue off your face or attempt it? I didn't get it all off my face. There was a lot of stuff still on my ears, my face. I couldn't get it all off because it was burning me from the paint thinner. So I just washed my face and we left. And then you got into Mr. Lorenzo's car and you went out and ate at Taco Bell. Yeah. Now, two phrases you use is that you were a street hustler, correct? Yeah. You did that for a number of years, right? Yeah. For much of that time, I think the phrase you used was, you were messed up in the head because of drug use. Do you remember using that phrase? Not messed up in the head, I was just going through a lot of stuff, so I just smoked. You smoked everything, and you've done just about every drug that was out on the streets. Yes. And this lasted for a five year period of time. On and off. But your mind is perfectly clear about the events to this day now, right? Yeah. That you, he gave you 200 for no reason other than just for you to buy some crack? It was for crack. It wasn't for a movie? No, it wasn't for a movie. No further questions. The court, redirect Mr. Vercelli. Mr. Vercelli, no, Your Honor. The court, thank you, Mr. Alba. You, you're excused to go. You may step down. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. I think my, my court reporter probably needs a break. That transcript was uh, 29 pages. The remaining two are each 32 pages. So just for uh, timing, what I suspect we'll do, we'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back. We'll do, if it's the uh, state's intention, to do the last two readings. And as I said, each of them are 32 pages. We'll see what time it is then and make a determination whether we'll do an early lunch and come back and do the live witnesses after or start the live witnesses. What I may ask the state is um, how much time you anticipate spending with them before I make that decision. Uh, should I ask about the bind, the, the, the search or the location of the three wing binder? Oh. Judge, the, um, the, the search, uh, I, the three wing binder, I, I located a, um, a 25 page mailing from Mr. Gonzalez to Andrew Warren and Jay Pruner dated March 23rd, 2020 with several exhibits which are attached. I believe that's what we are referring yeah, to. Yeah, well that's then I want to just get Mr. Gonzalez to verify he's not in his head. That's the mitigation packet that you submitted? It is, Judge. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it, it came in a it came in a binder, but obviously because I don't need the binder. Yeah, that's but fine, yeah, no, it just is. want to make sure I have whatever was submitted 
as uh, a mitigation. My recollection is, I remember discussing this, this is when the state was going to the Homicide Committee. There were negotiations regarding having uh, Mr. Lorenzo plead to life um, and that a presentation was going to be made to the Homicide Committee. It's my recollection, and you wanted the time to submit the mitigation package, and then ultimately um, uh, no offer was made to Mr. Lorenzo. But just because that's referenced um, and I know about it now, I want to have it in my possession from the state in order to take it into consideration as any possible mitigation. Yes, Judge, and in fact, March 23rd, 2020 is the mitigation package that I submitted on Mr. Lorenzo's behalf to the state for its consideration. All right, let me ask, I think technically we should probably have it marked as at least a court exhibit. Yeah, we'll mark it as a court exhibit. I think we have one court exhibit so far, so this will be court exhibit two. Because okay. I want it all in the record, you know, um, what mitigation I've considered. But uh, I ultimately will take it back with me when, uh, when we make a decision as to when and how I'm going to deliberate uh, before issuing the Senate. But I appreciate that. Thank you very uh, much uh, for finding that, Mr. Dirks. You're welcome, Your Honor. The other matter I think maybe was discussed was the transcript of the sentencing yes. hearing. Uh, I, we sent the transcript, at least that we have, we have a 20, a 42 page sentencing hearing transcript, which has been previously provided. Yeah, I, I have that, but there's references in it. It appears from reading it that there was more to the sentencing proceeding. And I just wanted to make sure that there isn't something out there that I don't have available to me that may have constituted any mitigation. I, I just don't want the, uh, the opportunity for anything to be suggested or for the Supreme Court to question if, if I was to decide um, to sentence Mr. Lorenzo to death. I completely understood, Your Honor. I, I, when, when we discussed this in, in the past weeks, I requested of, uh, or my, my assistant requested of Claudia who testified earlier that we needed the entire sentencing proceeding transcript. This is what was provided to me, and that, to my knowledge, that's all that okay. there is. All right. available. Well, that may be the answer. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, have you had an opportunity to take a look or read, or do you agree? Judge, I, I can tell the court that, that I did receive timely the document from the state. I reviewed it. I gave it to Mr. Lorenzo in person. He had it. He's acknowledged that he's reviewed it. Yes. Whether it is the entirety of whatever proceeding took place, I can't tell the court that simply because I was not there. But I can tell you that the, the state has indicated to me that's what they received from the federal court. And, and I mean, if that's what was asked for and that's what was provided, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But let me ask um, Mr. Lorenzo, because it seems like you want to be heard. Um, you have a comment on that? I, it's 20 years. It's so, so long ago. So, but... What I saw looked like it was there. It was all there. It looked like it, from okay. what I remember, but it was a long time ago. All right. Yeah. I just want to use, you know, do as much due diligence on the court's part to um, make sure that I have available to me any potential mitigation, because I think I have that obligation, even though Mr. Lorenzo has, has waived and intends to waive and wants me to sentence him to death. Um, I just want to err on the side of caution. but. I'll accept those representations, including the statement from Mr. Lorenzo at this time, that it appears to be everything. I think it's fine. And I think we have lots of other stuff, including the mitigation um, packet and Mr. Lorenzo's uh, document, which is titled Mitigation Notice, which was submitted back in 2020, um, well, that's 2021. But uh, when Mr. Lorenzo was pursuing a different path and submitting, it seems like, any mitigation on his behalf. So I'm comfortable in the end that I may have everything that can be considered as mitigation. Yes, Mr. Lorenzo. Now, um, I was going to ask this question to you. The 161-page document I just put in, that mitigation and objection thing, uh, mitigation, the last thing I find. Right. Could that be my memorandum to you? Because it covered, kind of covered everything. Uh, Can that be if you soon? wish it to be, um, yeah. I certainly have reviewed it. We'll continue to review it when I get to the deliberation stage, whether that be 
um, tonight or whether that be in a week or a month or whatever, I certainly will take into, take that into consideration, anything you file. Right, and then if we do do a memorandum thing, maybe I could just do an addendum of things if I see something that needs to be added to it, but that covers that, everything. I, well, and I appreciate you. You are very thorough, let me say that. Yes, yeah, so. Uh, makes, yeah. But as I said, if you decide to proceed today at the conclusion of these hearings, you'll have an opportunity to orally um, supplement or argue anything that you wish on your behalf and in response to anything that the state says in their oral uh, closing as opposed to a memorandum. Okay. Judge, right. I'll discuss that with Mr. Yes. Uh, Lorenzo during the break. I appreciate that. And I, I'm not going to come back and ask for him a decision then. As I said, that's something that I can get a decision from him at the end of uh, the state, not at the end of the defense presentation. Mr. Dirks. Your Honor, the, the sentencing transcript that we discussed just a couple of minutes ago, may I offer that as an exhibit as well? Yes, I think that that's appropriate to make it. Go ahead and let's mark it a um, court exhibit number three. I will prepare the proper label. I appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, we want to make sure the record is as uh, perfected as possible. Thank you. Let's take a 15 minute break. So we'll come back at 11 o'clock.
what it is. The, mit the mitigation packet. Okay. Should be the same that Mr. Dirk brought up. I have to be wrong on the number. seem to be taking about 30 minutes each and as I said these two are slightly longer than the last one that we did so I, I hate to right. then start those two at 12 or after no, I understand. we don't need to take a long lunch break we can take an hour lunch break and come back at whatever time we break so if you want to tell them let's right. let's go ahead and do that okay, thank you. I'm gonna let them know. all right appreciate it all right mr. Riley mr. Coy who's uh, who's on which side now you Switch it again on me? Yes, I get a chance to sit down. You get to come yes. sit yes. in the witness stand. Travis. Normally I would swear Travis. you in as a witness. Uh oh. It's, no. no, not this one. It's technically, we're doing Juan Ortiz. Oh, oh. okay. Let me. Well, second thought. <laughs> well, you can still sit in the audience, Mr. Coy. Oh, well, thanks. Yes, I appreciate it. Um, Ortiz, Juan Ortiz, for the record, is state's composite. H-E, and Mr. Riley, you're going to be reading Mr. Ortiz's portion. That's correct, Your Honor. All right, I have, oh, whoops, I have Lear. Where's Mr. Uh, Sean Crenshaw, Thank you. on behalf of the state. And Mr. Crenshaw is going to be reading Mr. Porcelli's part. Yes, Your Honor, in addition to the cross-examination. Uh, oh, that's right. By the defense attorney. Well, right now, you're Porcelli. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. All right, I have Ortiz transcript. Uh, let me see if the defense is ready. I'll give you time if uh, if you need it, Mr. Lorenzo. I see you're discussing something with Mr. Gonzalez. If you need additional time, let me know. No, no, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you, sir. All right, no, you're welcome. All right, then we're ready to proceed. Sounds good. Having firstly been duly sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, was examined and testifies as follows. Please take a seat in the witness box. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Juan Ortiz, O-R-T-I-Z. Good afternoon, Mr. Ortiz. Yes, good afternoon. How old are you? 27. Where are you currently residing? San Francisco, California. How long have you lived in San Francisco? Almost nine months, 10 months. Prior to living in San Francisco, did you reside in the Tampa Bay area? Yes. <laughs> What time frame did you live in the Tampa Bay area? For about four years. When did you leave the Tampa Bay area? Where? When? Oh, I lived in Tampa from 2000 until 2004. While you were living in the Tampa Bay area, did you ever have an occasion to meet an individual by the name of Steven Lorenzo? Yes. Do you recall when this happened? May 17th, 2003. Do you see that individual in court today? Yes. Can you point him out and describe what he is wearing for the court, please? 
Right there. Gray suit, yellow tie. I'd ask the record reflect he's identified the defendant. The court responds the record will reflect the fact. Let's talk about how you met the defendant on this date. Can you explain where you were when you met the defendant? I met him at a gay bar called 2606. Let me do something here before you go further. Let me publish what's been previously admitted into evidence as government exhibit number 98. If you can look at this, that screen before you, do you recognize government exhibit number 98? Yes, that's the gay bar 2606. This is the bar you met the defendant at? Yes. Describe how you met the defendant. I got there around midnight. Yeah, midnight. I didn't know between midnight and 1 a.m. And then I sat down at the gay bar, and I mean the bartender introduced him to me. Okay. Why did you go to the bar that night? Uh, well, I was at a party before, a cast party in a play that I was in, and just decided to go and have a drink. Did you say a cat's party? <laughs> cast. I was in a play that day. That was the last time. Just for the record, you said cast, not the play cats. Yes, a cast party, yeah. Were you at the bar by yourself? Yes. You indicated that the bartender at the bar introduced you to the defendant? Yes. Did you engage in conversation with the defendant? Yes. Do you remember what the conversation was about? We talked about theater because he said he used to live in New York and, well, that was my first place that I was in. And I was very excited and I just thought that was, you know, really nice that I met this guy and we were talking about theater and all that, all of this stuff. How long did you talk to the defendant at the 2606 bar? I don't know, probably an hour or so. How did you? How did you leave the 2606 bar? I followed him in my car. Okay. Did he invite you to go with him anywhere? Yeah. He asked if I wanted to come to his house for a drink, and I said yes. Why did you accept his offer to go to his residence? Well, again, he seemed like a very nice guy. He didn't look weird or anything to me. And again, we were talking about this stuff, about theater, and I thought it was very interesting, and that's why I accepted to go with him. When you accepted to go or at any other time in this evening, did you ever talk about engaging in sexual contact with the defendant? We never talked about having sex. Did you give him any indication that you wanted to have sex with him? No. What about bondage or S&M activity? Did you ever talk about that? No. Did you give him any indication you wanted to participate in such activity? No. How did you get to the defendant's residence? I drove. I mean, I followed him in my car. Have you ever been to that residence prior to this night? No, that was the first time. Explain to the members of the jury what you recall about when you parked at the defendant's residence. Well, we got there and he brought his car in the driveway and then I parked behind him. It a, was a long highway, I mean driveway, and on the right was a fence and another house and then his house was on the left. The door that we went to the house was on the left, too. We didn't go into the house using the main door. You used the back door? Yeah. Do you remember if there was a garage at the residence? I'm not sure. There was something at the end of the driveway that looked like maybe a storage facility or something, but I'm not sure if it was a garage. Did the defendant show you any other parts of the house before you entered the house? Yeah. He showed me like a small efficiency that he was working on, it was behind the house, and I think that's what he used to do for a living, like fix stuff houses. Why do you say that? Why do I say that? Yeah, why do you say that? Because he told me. I think he used to do that, and he was fixing the efficiency to rent it out or something. Explain what happened once you got inside the defendant's residence. Okay, so he opened the door, he went inside, and he asked me if I wanted something to drink. And I said yes. He said, what? do you want? And I said, wine, red wine. So he went to like a little bar or something and his back was to me and he poured a glass of wine and then he just handed it to me. Where did you drink the wine at? I had a sip of the wine right there and then we, you know, we went to his living room to listen to music and just sat down on the sofa. We just started talking. How long were you in the living room talking to the defendant? Oh, well, I finished my glass and had another one in probably a couple of hours. You said you finished your glass of wine. 
Let me ask you, prior to having this glass of wine, did you have any other alcoholic beverages? Yeah, I had the drink at the bar. How many drinks did you have at the bar? At the bar, one, gin and tonic. When you got the second glass of wine, did you notice anything about the wine at all? Well, it was a little, it tasted a little bitter. And I asked him, you know, why? And he said, because it's Cabernet. But you know, I drank red wine before so many times and, but that's not why. So I just thought maybe the bottle was open for so long and maybe that's why it tasted like that. I never, you know, thought anything else. Do you remember drinking that entire glass? I drank one glass and then by the time I finished it, we were in the living room and you know, he offered me a second one and I said yes. So we went back to the bar and he poured me another glass and brought it back and I drank. Before I finished the second glass of wine, you know, we were listening to music and he kept insisting. You know, he kept telling me to just lay down on the floor. And I sat down on the floor and we were looking at the stereo. As I remember, it was 5 a.m. and he kept saying, you know, just relax, relax, relax. And that's all I remember. When you say that's all you remember. Until I woke up like hours after. Okay, let's back up a little bit. How were you feeling when you were drinking the second glass of wine? Well, I was feeling really drunk. Like I didn't know why because, you know, I had drunk before and I just was feeling very drunk without drinking that much that night. But that's it. I was feeling drunk. When you say drunk, what type of symptoms were you experiencing? Like lightheaded, like kind of dizzy, you know, when you're really drunk. Like you're just dizzy and yeah. Did you feel like you were going to pass out? I felt that, especially when I sat down on the floor. I felt like, you know, I would just fall asleep probably. You said you lost consciousness. Do you recall what time it was? Yeah, I remember when we were, when we were on the floor and he kept saying, lay down, lay down. I remember on the stereo it was 5 a.m. And that's what I remember because he kept saying, you know, just lay down, lay down. And that's all I remember, that I saw 5 a.m. on the stereo. Let me ask you, what's the next thing you remember after that point? Uh, then I woke up around 7 a.m., but before I opened my eyes, I thought I was having a nightmare because, like, you know, I didn't see anything. I thought I was asleep, and I felt like I was trapped in something, and I just kept, like, screaming and moving, and I couldn't. That just went for a little while, and then when I finally opened my eyes, I was on the floor, and he was on the top of me, and I was all tied up, and I just couldn't move. I was. I remember I was screaming, and he put his hand on my mouth, you know, to prevent me from screaming, and that's what I remember when I woke up. You said he was on top of you. Who was that? Pardon? You said he was on top of you. Who were you referring to? Steven. That's the defendant? Yes. You said you were tied up. Do you recall how you were tied up? Yeah. There were like plastic straps, I guess, and I was tied up on my ankles and my elbows, my arms, and my knees. I just couldn't move. Did you try to move? I tried to move, but it was just... You cannot move anywhere. All I could do was like look around me. I just had the windows and I'd just scream. But he would out his hand on my mouth again and he was telling me I was screaming and he would say, don't scream because no one will listen to you. No one will hear you. And he kept saying that he was going to beat the shit out of me if I didn't shut up. And I just wanted to, you know, to leave. But I couldn't. I couldn't move. What were you thinking at that time? Well, you know, I didn't know what he was going to do to me. I thought he was going to kill me or torture me. I didn't know what he was going to do. Did it ever hit you at any time? Yeah. Well, I was, I was tied up with three plastic straps. My elbows had like a belt, and I think it was a leather belt, and my hands. And somehow, somehow, I loosened it, and he got really... And when he saw that I freed my hands, that's when he was mad and he's saying that he was going to beat the shit out of me. He tried to tie me up again with a belt and I let him and I wouldn't let him do it and he was getting just really upset, more upset every time. What did he do? Uh, well, he slapped me a couple times in the face, he slapped me and he said he was going to choke me until I passed out and he just went on and on. He finally dragged me by my feet and he took me to his living room, to his bedroom, sorry. So all this was occurring inside the... Living room, yeah. Okay. And you were naked and restrained in the living room? 
When I was drinking the wine before I passed out, I was fully clothed. I mean, I was, you know, with my clothes on. When I woke up and I was tied up, I was naked. Was the defendant clothed when you woke up? I think he was naked too, probably wearing underwear only. Before he moved you to another location, did he indicate to you on how long he was going to keep you? No. He just... No. He just dragged me by my feet and he threw me up on the bed. And what he wanted to do was tie me up again to the headboard. So I didn't let him do it and he was really pissed. And again, I just struggled. So he went to some place in the house and he brought another of, of those plastic straps. And what he was going to try to do was he was going to choke me to see if until I passed out so he could tie me up again. I put my fingers in my nose like this to prevent him from choking me with the plastic straps and that's why I got so much so many scratches in my nose he got really upset because I didn't let him do it so we struggled for some more hours and I finally I was so tired and you know I was kind of giving in at that point I asked him if he could just loosen up a little bit those plastic straps and he loosened I mean he tried to loosen up a little bit the ones on my ankles but I felt but it felt the same my feet were feeling cold and after that, I asked him for some water because I was really, I mean, really thirsty. Did he give you any water? He went to the kitchen, I guess. He bought me a glass of water, I guess, and I, drink the I drank the water, and that's it. I was just so tired, and I finally gave in. And that what he did was he tied me up again. Let me ask you, you said you finally gave in. What do you mean by that? I was so tired because this went on. I remember there was a clock in his room, and I was probably like 10 a.m. So for the first time I woke up on the floor in the living room, it was 7 a.m. It was a few hours, you know, just struggling and screaming with him, you know, and telling him to, why are you doing this to me? Let me go and all this. And I just finally felt like I just couldn't do anything else. So he tied me, he tied my hands back again, and he put duct tape on my mouth and my eyes. And then and then all I could think was, you know, God, help me. And my dad, this is dead. That is dead. You know, just, I don't know. Like my life is in your hands, you know. I mean, my dad and God help me. That's all I remember. When he put the duct tape in my eyes and my mouth, I've just passed out. So after he tied you up again and placed duct tape over your eyes, you had passed out again? Yes. Do you know how long you were out for? When I passed out the second time? Yes. Uh, then I woke up around 5 p.m. again, and we were still in, I was still in the bed, and when I woke up, it was 5 p.m., and I was naked, and, but I was free. I didn't, have, I didn't have any ties or anything. Where was the defendant? He was next to me. We were like back to back, so there was a clock on my side, and I saw it was 5 p.m., and I didn't know what to do. I was free. But I didn't know, you know, if I should run and maybe, but maybe the doors were locked and I was naked. You know, if I run, maybe he would follow me, grab me or catch me again or do something to me. So I was just thinking, how could I get out, you know, of the house and think that the only thing I thought about was just to, you know, like pretend that nothing happened. So it was about 5 p.m. I had to work at 11 p.m. that night. So I told him that I had to be at work at 7, much earlier, so I would, you know, go home and have an excuse to go home. And I also told him that I was hungry, hoping to go outside to McDonald's or something to eat. I just wanted to get myself out of the house, you know. So you were thinking of anything you could do to get out of the residence. Yeah. So I told him I had to go to work at 7 and I was hungry. So he made, so he said, okay, I can fix you something to eat. I said, okay. And he asked me where I wanted to eat. And I said, well, outside, because got like some, like a porch or something, I made outside. So I thought, you know, once I'm outside with my clothes on, everything is going to be all right. You know, like at least I could run away from him. Did you think about running away? If I were outside and he was going to do something to me, I could run away. But while I was inside the house, I knew I couldn't run away because I was naked and I didn't know if he locked the doors. So at that time, you were just thinking of a way to get outside. Yeah, so I just told him that I had to go to work and I'm hungry, and I didn't say anything. Like, I didn't say, he just acted like nothing happened. 
So I said, I'm going to take a shower. And when I got up and went to the bathroom, my body felt like somebody just beat me up. I mean, it was very painful. All my body ached. When I was taking a shower, I just had like bruises all over my body and on my hips. But when I was soaping, I also felt like I, you know, I felt something weird, like, you know, around my butt and everything. Then I realized that he shaved me and I, I was all shaved. So I took a shower, I put my clothes on, and then I went to the kitchen. He was fixing some grits or something, and we took the stuff outside, and then we were outside. I just ate as fast as I could, and just talked about all kinds of stuff, but not about what happened. Because if I said something to him about what happened, probably he was going to go crazy. I didn't know what to do, just don't mention it, and that's what I did. I just ate fast, and I don't talk about what happened. Did he talk about what happened at all? No. Was he acting differently towards you at the time? Just like nothing happened. Just like nothing happened. He even gave me his business card when I left. After you ate, did you leave the residence? Yes. What did you do after you left the residence? Well, I got in my car. When I sat down in the car, I closed the door. I just, you know, okay, now I'm safe, you know? Like nothing's going to happen. And I just drove back home. You know, I was just shaking. I just couldn't believe that this was happening to me. You see this in movies and you've heard stories. But at that point, when I was driving home, I just, I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. Did you go to the police? No, I drove to my house. Why didn't you go to the police then? Well, because, you know, first of all, it was embarrassing what happened to me. And if you go to the police and tell them all this stuff, probably they wouldn't believe me. And that's mainly why I didn't do it. Let me ask you, did you happen to video your injuries? Yes. When I got home, I had this video camera and I started filming it because I thought maybe I was going to go to the police. That's what I thought. It was everything. I was so confused right there because, again, I just didn't believe that was happening. That just happened to me. First of all, I was alive because I thought he was going to kill me or something. So I started taping me and that's it. I just filmed all the bruises and the marks from the plastic straps and yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness, the court? You may. Mr. Ortiz, I've just handed you what's been previously marked as government exhibit number 266-B. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yeah. What is that? It's a clip from the video that I took. And how do you recognize it? Because you showed it to me before. Are your initials on that exhibit? Yes. Is that video clip a fair and accurate depiction of the video you took of your injuries after this incident? I have. It was more, but after the months went by and I didn't decide, I decided not to go to the police. I just filled something else on top of it. Then when I finally took it to the police and I told them about this, I looked for it, but I only have a few seconds left. Okay. So when you originally filmed this, you had more film? Yes. It was my entire body and all the marks and everything. Okay, Your Honor, I move into evidence 266 hyphen B. Mr. Harrison, no objection. The court, it will be received. Request to publish. The court, all right, go ahead. If we can stop it there, back it up a little bit. Okay, for the record, we're looking at Government Exhibit 266-B. What's referenced to as 10 seconds on the exhibit? Mr. Ortiz, what are we looking at? Those are just bruises from when he slapped me and from the plastic straps when he was trying to put them around my neck. Are these bruises on your cheekbone as a result of the incident with the defendant? Uh-huh, yes. The swelling of your nose here, is that also a result of the incident with the defendant? Yes. Okay, if we can continue playing that exhibit. Okay, if we could stop it there, back up a little bit. For the record, we're looking at 21 and a half seconds. Mr. Ortiz, what are we looking at? Those are the marks from the plastic straps that he put on my arms, and that's why I couldn't move. These markings, uh, were they on both of your armpits? Yes. How long did you have those marks on your body? I don't know, probably days. Okay. If we could continue playing the exhibit, stop the exhibit. Are we looking at the other armpit and a similar abrasion on your arm? Yes. Was there a cut on your arm indicative of this blood mark there? I think it was from the straps when I was just struggling to, yeah. Okay, let's play the exhibit a little further. We see on exhibit 
hyphen B, there's a data stamp of May 18th of 2003. Is that the day you took this video? Yes. You indicated you took the video in anticipation of maybe going to the police. Yes. Did you go to the police soon thereafter this incident? No. Why didn't you go to the police? Well, because as I told you, I was just embarrassed and I just thought they were not going to believe me. So instead, I just went to my two best friends and my boss at the time. Did there come a time that you eventually went to the police? Yes. Why did you then go to the police at a later date? That was, I think it was December 2003, the same year, when those two guys disappeared from the gay club from 2606, so it was all over the news. I don't know, somehow I thought maybe this could be related. Maybe this guy met those guys and maybe they went too far. Probably they went too far. I mean, like, what he did to me, but this time he went too far. I don't know. It was just like an instant, like maybe it could be related. Also, my friends, the ones I told what happened to me, they also told me that, yeah, I should go to the police because it could be related. Mr. Ortiz, in your opinion, in your opinion, what happened to you in May of 2003? What happened to me, what I think is that, what I think is that he put something in those drinks and that is why I passed out. And honestly, I don't know what he did to me while I was unconscious. I have no idea. All I know from what I could see is that I was shaved. I had bruises all over my body and I was tied up and I didn't know what he did while I was unconscious. I have no idea. When you say he, who did this to you? Steven. Nothing further. The court, cross-examination. Cross-examination by Mr. Harrison. Do you know what a popper is? A what? Popper. Yes. What is poppers? I think people use it to get high or they're having sex, I don't know. Did you use poppers this night with Mr. Lorenzo? No. 2606, have you been to 2606 prior to meeting Mr. Lorenzo there? Yes. You know this to be a leather bar or a pickup type bar? Yes. This is a bar where individuals go to get picked up and go out and have sexual relationships? Yes. You went there that night with that intention? No. Now, you don't have any reason to believe that you were sexually assaulted, do you? Well, I don't know. I was unconscious. I don't know what he did to me. Well, there's nothing in your experiences, there was nothing to indicate that you were anally penetrated, right? I don't know. When you gained your wits about yourself, you didn't feel uncomfortable as if somebody had anally penetrated you, did you? As I told you earlier, all my body was in pain like someone beat me up. All my body was in pain when I was walking from the bed to the bathroom to take a shower. All I, my body, was in pain. And when I was soaping, I just felt something weird. Then I was shaved. But all of my body was in pain. I don't know what happened. In fact, didn't you engage in uh, mutual masturbation with Mr. Lorenzo? No. All we did that I remember when we were drinking the wine was I remember we kissed, but we were clothed, fully clothed. And one of the things you, the phrase you used, I can't believe this is happening to me, is the phrase you used on your examination. Do you remember that? Yes. In light of that, you still didn't tell the police, correct? Right. Even though the fact you documented this with video, you still didn't tell the police, did you? Yeah, I did. And at some point, you were saying you were tied up in the living room and you then repositioned into the bedroom. Do you remember that? Yes. In fact, you're the only one, you're, you're the one who walked in there. He. Oh, no, 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 no. That's what I say. He dragged me by my feet. I was laying down facing up. He dragged me. I couldn't move. I couldn't move. You said there were multiple times that he tied you and untied you, correct? No. What I said was I was tied up with these plastic straps and I'd freed my hands with a belt. There was a belt in my hand and I freed. That was the only thing I had free, this hand like this. Then when he took me to his bedroom, he tied me up again. He never untied me. He supposedly loosened the plastic straps on my ankles because I asked for it because my feet were feeling cold. He did it, but they felt the same. That's the only thing he did. Then after this whole incident was over with, you took a shower? Yes. You ate dinner? It wasn't dinner. He was again, yes. I ate dinner because I wanted to get out of the house. Then at some point you, you separated, you went back home? Yes. And in fact, Mr. Lorenzo gave you his business card, correct? Yeah, he gave it to me. 
Your Honor, if I could have a moment. The court, yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. The court, redirect, Mr. Porcelli. No, Your Honor. The court, may Mr. Ortiz return to San Francisco? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. You're free to go. Thank you for coming. Does that conclude your presentation for today? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. And Mr. Christopher Lear will be the last one. Lear, I have Lear. And Mr. Coy is coming back down to read to be, uh, oh no, he's coming down Mr. To, Lear. to be Mr. Lear. I will be the prosecutor. And you're going to be Porcelli. Yes, sir. And the defendant. Second chance to be in the hot seat. Go ahead and have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. I think this is my first time. Thank you, Judge. Is it your first time? It's first the time. Yeah, yeah, first, yeah. Uh-oh. That, that microphone is adjustable. All right. Thank you. <coughs> May I begin, Your Honor? Absolutely. Having first been duly sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, was examined and testified as follows. The clerk, please take a seat in the witness chair. Please state your name and spell your last for the record. My name is Chris Lear. L-E-E-R. Right. Direct examination. Good morning, Mr. Lear. Good morning. Sir, do you reside in Indianapolis? Yes. I'd like, you to uh, I'd like to take you to October of 2004. Do you recall if you were in St. Petersburg during that time frame? Yes. Can you tell us where you were at that uh, during that time frame? October, you said, right? Yes. I was at Suncoast Resort. Where is that located? In St. Petersburg. Why are we at the Suncoast Resort in October of 2004? Vacationing with, there's a large group of friends from Indianapolis that do a yearly trip to Suncoast for a vacation. About 20 of them or so that go down every year. I went down there with them for my first time. How long were you there? From the 19th or 20th until the, we left on the 25th. Can you describe the layout of the Sun Coast Resort? It used to be a Holiday Inn. It's a very large, it's in a U-shape, about three stories tall, all the way around. In the middle, there's a big courtyard with a tiki bar. It has volleyball courts, swimming pool. There's about three different bars in it. One being a disco bar, where they do shows at one being a piano bar, another one more like a leather bar type of thing. There are several different stores in there, restaurants. It's said to be the largest gay resort in North America. Were you actually staying in a room at the Sun Coast Resort? Yes, I was. Can you describe what your room looked like? Just your basic Holiday Inn room. It was on the third floor on the back side of the horseshoe shaped facility. Do you recall how many beds were in that room? There was two beds. Two queen-size beds. Were you staying with somebody else in the room? No, by myself. Are you familiar with what is called tea dance? Yes. Okay, what is the tea dance? A tea dance is what they do every Sunday, and it starts at 4.30. What it is, is they bring out a lot of different speakers, and they play dance music, and they bring out more areas for vending for hot dogs and grilling out and that kind of stuff. Basically, it's just a big dance party that they do every Sunday. It starts at 4.30 and goes until about 11 or so. And it's just a big dance and big celebration of life. A lot of people wear costumes and that kind of stuff. Did you attend the tea dance while you were staying at the Sun Coast Resort? Yes, I did. Was this on a Sunday while you were there? Yes. In relation to when you were to return home, how soon was it before you returned trip home? It was the day before. So you returned to Indianapolis on the Monday? Yeah, Monday morning. What time did you arrive at the tea dance? We got there right after wave running in the ocean at about 3.30. When you say we, who are you referring to? Me and one of my friends went out and did the jet skis in the ocean and got back to the Sun Coast Resort at about 3.30 or 3.30 or 4 o'clock. And did you immediately go to the tea dance? We went and changed and showered and got to the tea dance at about 4.30, right when the music started playing real loud. Did you begin consuming alcoholic beverages during that tea dance? Yes. Approximately, how many do you think you consumed while you were at the tea dance? During the whole time, probably 10 or more. What time of drinks were you having? Cranberry and vodka. 
I'm going to publish what's been previously admitted into evidence as Government Exhibit 267. If you can look at that screen before you right there. There's nothing there. It will come up in a second. Oh, okay. 267C. There's an individual wearing a dark colored shirt and those images. Do you recognize that individual? Yes. How do you recognize that individual? That's the individual that drugged and sexually assaulted me. When you say drugged and sexually assaulted you, what do you mean? Later on in the evening, I felt that he slipped me a drug into my drink. And then, when I started getting ready to get all dizzy and felt like I was going to fall down, I needed to get back to my room. He followed me and back to my room. When I got to my room, I started getting ready to take my phone out, put it on the chair, and then I realized he was in my room and something was wrong because I felt like I had been drugged and I told him. I realized he was in there and I told him, you need to get out of here. And he said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'll kick your ass. And he laughed and he pushed me down on the bed. By now, for some reason, I became paralyzed and I couldn't move. Before we get there, let me ask you a few questions. Sure. How did you first see the individual during that evening? I was sitting at the Tiki bar having drinks and was, had a conversation with him. What type of conversation? Just like talking conversation. I don't recall what we all said. By what time was it on the evening when you first met this individual? Around 8 o'clock. Did there come a point in the evening where you became concerned about him? Yes. Can you explain that? Well, he seemed nice enough in the beginning, but as the evening went on, he kind of was making a lot of sexual advances and became more aggressive. If I go to the restroom, he'll follow me there. And I tried to leave, and he kind of blocked my way and just started getting more aggressive and weird as the evening went on. So I didn't want to have anything to do with him. Did you talk with anyone about this? Yeah, some of my friends, and I even pointed him out to one of my friends, too, that this is the person that's been bothering me. Do you know an Elliot Carte? Yes. Is that someone that was on the trip with you? Yes. Did you discuss that with him? Yes. Did you say anything to the defendant to leave you alone? I'm sorry? Did you tell the defendant to leave you alone? I had a friend of mine tell him. Did there come a point in time in the evening where you encountered the defendant again? Yes. Can you explain that? I had pretty much gotten away from him for most of the time. And then towards the end of the night, the music kind of goes down a little bit, around 11 o'clock. A big group of my friends were there with me at the Tiki Bar. And they all went to the disco bar where they had shows going on. And I was sitting there talking with the person here on the left that I was talking with. So they all went and I was left alone. Was the person you were talking to one of the friends that traveled down with you? No, he wasn't. Was the someone, was that someone that you met that evening? Yes. Do you remember that person's name? No, it was just somebody I was just having a conversation with. And then what happened? Then the, so my friends all left and I was talking to the person on my left. And the next thing I know, he's on my right. Who's he? Steven Lorenzo. So he's on my right and I'm trying to talk to the person on the left and my drink is over here. I didn't know to guard a drink. So then the next thing I know, I'm getting dizzy. He keeps wanting to take me, give me a back rub, that kind of thing, which I didn't want to have anything to do with. Let me ask you, you made your drink Excuse me. Let me ask you. You said your drink is over here. Can you describe the position of the drink? Drink over here. To the right of you? To the right of me. Was it in your sight? Many times it wasn't because I was talking to somebody here on the left. Did you consume that drink? Yes. What happened to you after you consumed that drink? All of a sudden, all of a sudden I'm fine. Then all of a sudden, I'm dizzy. I'm ready to fall down. It just hits you like a brick wall. You said you had about 10 drinks throughout the day. Is it possible you could have just drunk at that point? No, I'm just thinking just drinking doesn't hit you like a wall like that. I have a lot of experience with drinking, and this was not that. This was all of a sudden, you're fine. Then all of a sudden, you're ready to fall on the ground. You're dizzy and just very strange. I've never felt like that before. What did you do? I knew I had to make my way back to my room because I was just... Otherwise, I was going to just fall over. So I started making my way back to the room, and a lot of that is real vague to me. I had to go up three flights of steps, and I think he was helping me trying to get back to my room. Who is he? Steven Lorenzo. Let me ask you, 
Do you think at that time something was wrong? All I was thinking about at that time was I needed to get back to my room. I was. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize something was going on until I got back to my room and it kind of came to me that this is not right. Something is really bad here. What happened in the room? So in the room, I get there and I take my phone out and put it on the chair and I empty my pockets. Then I realize something is really bad here. Then I realize he's in the room. Who is that? Steven Lorenzo. What did you do? <clears throat> so I just started realizing that I think I probably have been drugged here. And this guy is in the room and I'm panicking. And I said, you need to get out of here. That's when he said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, I'll kick your ass. And he said, he just pushed me down on the bed. And that's when I felt my, I couldn't move. And I knew if I could just reach my phone, I could call 911, but I couldn't move my arm. It was like I became paralyzed. I just couldn't move. What were you thinking at that time? Then I felt him pull my shorts down and felt my back area being manipulated. And I was thinking that somebody has drugged me and he's going to do this. I'm probably not going to wake up in the morning. What do you mean by that? I mean, I felt it was probably it, you know. Hopefully none of you have ever had to experience somebody drugging you and not being able to move and being paralyzed and you being the person that is, you don't know what they're going to do to you. But you figure if they have done this, you're probably not going to wake up. Did you try to fight back? I couldn't move, otherwise I would have. You said you remember your bottom area being manipulated. Do you know what was happening? Not really. I just knew I was. Felt like I was starting to be tortured. Did you lose consciousness at any point? Yes, from then on. Do you know what time of evening this was? It would have been around the midnight range, because the music stops around 11, and I was at the tiki bar for a time after that. So it had to be around the midnight range. Do you know how long it was before you regained consciousness? Uh, I woke up around, at around, I believe, 8 or 9 in the morning. I think our flight was around 10 or 11. Explain what happened when you woke up. I woke up face down, which I never sleep, on my stomach. But, and my pants were back up. The curtains were open, which was weird, because I always kept those curtains shut. I woke up and I said, oh... I've got to get ready to go meet everybody downstairs because we're all, you know, some of us had rental cars and we were all carpooling back to the airport to fly back. Then I got up and I felt a little pain in that, my rectum area, and so I, but I had to get ready, get everything packed up, and I went to jump in the shower and just kind of look back in the mirror. And when I looked back in the mirror, oh, right, my butt area was purple, bruised, real bad, and I'm, I just, it was so strange because when I woke up, it was like I couldn't remember anything. I never experienced anything like that before. I couldn't think of anything that happened. It was like a wall was up around my memories. I looked in the mirror and didn't know, understand that, how that happened. So I took my shower and went downstairs and I was waiting there at a table to meet everybody. And the whole time I just kind of leaned back in my chair and it was so strange because I couldn't, it was like I couldn't think. I couldn't remember anything. Just so lethargic, no memories, no thoughts in my head. I was real lucky that all my friends drove us back and I just like followed them through the lines to get on the airplane, because I couldn't think. I got on the airplane, it hurt to sit, but I was just, there was not much going on, on up in my head. Did there come a time when you began to realize what happened to you? Well, when I got back, I drove back to my house, immediately went to, the, went to the bathroom and looked again and just really knew something had happened, but I didn't know what it was. So then I made some calls to my friends and said, I told them what's going on. They said, well, better get yourself to an immediate care center right away and get checked out and make sure everything is okay. So that made sense, so I went and did that. That was when I started realizing what had happened? Started starting to realize I think I've been drugged and raped. So then I got to the immediate care center and got the doctor inspected me and everything and a lot of bruising, he said, but nothing seemed to be torn, just very stressed out. You went for treatment for this. Did you go to the police ab about this? No. Why not? 
The immediate care doctor even asked if I wanted to make a report, and at that time, I didn't even really know what happened. I couldn't. Plus, I figured that there was probably over a thousand people there, not just staying at the hotel, but the locals too, that came there. And how would they ever catch somebody like that? The truth be, I didn't even know what happened yet. I didn't even. I just wasn't sure. All I was really concerned with was myself at the time, making sure that I was going to be okay. Mr. Lear, in your opinion, what happened to you that evening at the Suncoast Resort? That Stephen Lorenzo was sitting beside me here and drugged my drink and followed me back to, if not helping me back to my room, and waited until I went paralyzed and sexually tortured me, and that's it. You say sexually tortured you. Did you notice anything that concerned you regarding your bathroom personal effects? Yes. When I was packing up and getting everything in my luggage, I grabbed my air extra dry can and there was a film almost three-fourths of the way up my air extra dry can. I didn't know what that came from. Why would there be a film on there? I didn't. I packed it away and didn't think anything else about it. But do you see the individual in court today that did this to you? Yes. Can you point him out and describe what he is wearing? Yes, right there. Gray suit, gray tie, and glasses. Your Honor, I'd ask the record to reflect his identify the defendant. The court, the record will reflect that fact. Nothing further. Cross-examination by Mr. Harrison. Question. Mr. Lear, from your stay at the Sun Coast, you became familiar with its amenities from pools to volleyball courts to bars to disco as well as other stores, correct? Correct. This wasn't your first time at the Sun Coast, was it? Yes. Would you describe the Sun Coast as a place that people pick up other people for short duration relationships? I'm sure. In other words, one night stands. That I'm sure that goes on there too, along with other people just coming to have fun. Do you know what the phrase popper means? A popper is something that people snort, I believe. That kind of gives them a rush type thing. On this weekend, while you were at the Sun Coast Resort, did you have occasion or frequent one of the little stores in that facility where you bought some of those little poppers? No. And what room number were you in? It was the third floor. I don't recall the exact room number. I think it was around the 320, 321 range or so. And when you went down there, you said you went down there with approximately two dozen of your friends and acquaintances. Yes. Some of these were your close friends. Uh, yeah. At some point, you related to those close friends of yours that Mr. Lorenzo was bothering you. Right. And then they left you alone with Mr. Lorenzo. <laughs> That's correct. Even after you told them, this guy is bothering me. Yes. Well, he wasn't there at the time they left me alone. You didn't share your room with anyone, right? No. That was, most of the individuals had single rooms or singly occupied rooms. The couples didn't, but some of them did. And you went there alone? Yes. To engage in party, to engage in alcohol, to engage in frolic? To have fun. Who was the friend you went out on the jet ski with? John Esquadro. Did this gentleman also accompany you throughout the night? I wouldn't say he accompanied me throughout the night, no. He was there most of the time, probably. Now, you were saying you had a conversation with this gentleman who was sitting to your left, and you were saying Mr. Lorenzo then approached and was on your right side. Correct. Now, there were thousands of people around at this point, right? Not at that point. That was towards the end of it. Was there a bartender? Yes. Was there more than one bartender behind the bar? I don't recall how many bartenders there were. Judge may approach so he can demonstrate the layout of how the individuals were seating. The court, sure. Question. Do you know, sir, if the other individual had drink in their hand that you were talking to on the left? I don't recall. Imagine I am this gentleman. Would I be about the location or was it further forward of you? Or am I about in the right location to your side? That's probably about the right location. Can you demonstrate, sir, with the cup where your drink was? There were times it was over here. Now, during the course of our conversation or the conversation you were having with this gentleman, during the course of your conversation with this gentleman, are you drinking out of your cup? Sure. Can you demonstrate to the jury why, what you would do? Take a drink out of my cup and put it back. Would you have time? Would you have to time? To see my cup? Sure. Okay, so you're saying that when you turned to get your cup and you drank it, you didn't put it down in front of you, you would, uh, you would set it back behind you again. 
There were times it was sitting over here. I'm sure there were times it was sitting over here. I'm sure there were times it was sitting here. And if I'm speaking to you, and if I'm the gentleman who is talking to you, I'm looking at you, correct? Yes. And I can see the cup. Okay. Did that gentleman ever indicate to you that this gentleman next to you put something in your cup? No. Do you have reason to believe that this gentleman you were talking to to your left had anything to do with Mr. Lorenzo? Not that I'm aware of. You don't believe this gentleman on your left was acting as a distraction to give Mr. Lorenzo an opportunity to put something in your cup? Not that I'm aware of. How many people do you think were around that bar? I don't recall how many there were at that time. Sir, what is the shape of the bar? It's a square. So there would be people on the far side who would be sitting at the bar looking in your direction, correct? Sure. There would be people sitting on the side who are sitting at the bar and would be looking in your direction, correct? Uh-huh. There would be people sitting on the other side of the bar looking in your direction, correct? Could be. And there would be bartenders within in that square that would be also looking in your direction, correct? I'm sure they could be looking in any direction, yes. And no one indicated to you that I just saw him put something in your drink, did they? No, they did not. This arid extra dry can, you said this had this film on it. Right. You are not indicating, trying to indicate to the jury that Mr. Orlando di Lorenzo did something to you with that own, are you? All I'm telling is what I found. What kind of film was it, sir? I don't know. Did Mr. Lorenzo leave you his business card for cobblestone home inspections? No. And then finally, you said that when you woke up, you saw your room was open in terms of its screening material, its curtains. Witness indicated affirmatively. And you don't recall opening it yourself? No. But it is possible you opened up the curtains yourself? I don't recall that. The question I asked you, but it is possible though, right? I don't think so. And again, you do not call, or you did not call the police after this discovery of what allegedly happened to you, did you? No. And it was only after coaching or coaxing by your friends that you decided you wanted to go to the doctor, correct? I called a friend of mine and they, I told them what had happened and all the bruising. And they said you need to go to a doctor. I was confused at the time. During the course of this week, you had engaged in had taken other men up to your room. One. Did you engage in any type of use of either illegal drugs? No. Or poppers? No. During the course of this thing, Mr. Lorenzo, did you ever wear a gas mask? No. Did you ever have anything on your face that would indicate you were wearing a gas mask? No. If I can have a moment, no further questions, Your Honor. The court redirect. Question. As far as if you're possible... As far as if you possibly wore a gas mask or anything that way, do you have any memory at all during what happened to you that evening? Of wearing a gas mask? Yes. No. Nothing further. The court. May Mr. Lear return home? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Lear. You're free to go. Thank you, Mr. Cool. You may step down. Thank you. That concludes the transcript. All right, Mr. Diaz. Your Honor, my understanding is the court's intention is to take a break for lunch at this point. Yeah, I think so. It's uh, um, we were pretty close on uh, the time estimate. It's uh, twelve o'clock, so I'm thinking that we'll take we'll round it up and take an hour break. Come back at one o'clock. Is that uh, that's fine? I told my witnesses to be back just a few minutes before one. I didn't think we'd restart before one. All right, that that is uh, perfect. Then, is there anything else? Is there anything from the defense? Mr. Lorenzo, anything before we take a lunch break? No, I am good. Thank you, sir. You are very welcome. All right, so let's go ahead and take a lunch break. We'll reconvene at 1 o'clock.